Okay. All right, we're ready to go. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm Eric Edgley, the Habitat Section Chief for the Division of Wildlife Resources here in Salt Lake City. Um, glad that those of us who could be here in person are here. There's a lot who couldn't make it here because of snow down south. Um, so lucky for them, they're getting some water, which is good. Um, first off, I need to thank Daniel, Allison, and Lisa, and Danny Summers for helping us out, meeting all set up, and and uh, coordinating all of this. Um, I'd like to have the members of the council introduce themselves. Um, and uh, we'll start with Tyler and just go around the room. I'm Tyler Thompson. I'm the Watershed Program Director with DNI. Okay. I'm Justin Shannon. I'm the Chief of Wildlife. Steve Sorensen. I'm all the big game. Good morning, everyone. I'm Drew Cushing, the Chief of Fisheries. Benjamin Allen, Sport Fish Volunteer. Jack Ray, Waterfowl. All right. Thanks. Uh, one last introduction I want to make everybody aware of in our northern region office out of Ogden. We now have a new habitat manager, and he's here with us today. Daniel Olson sitting over in the corner here. Uh, we're glad to have him on board as our new habitat manager there moving forward. So wanted to introduce him as well. Hey, and I was just yeah. gonna I was just gonna step in and say, hey, I apologize for not being there in person, but this is Randy Hutchison with Upland. Right. Thank you, Randy. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, yeah, we appreciate Randy being online with us today. Um, he wasn't able to be here in person, so. Um, so the next thing we want to do is uh, observing public meeting rules. Uh, we'll we can show the minutes from our last meeting. All right, so these are the minutes from our last meeting. Uh, we need to get a motion to approve those minutes. Before. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, we have a motion from Tyler. Second the motion. And a second from Jack. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Um, the next item of business that will approve the agenda for today. Forward. And we'll let uh, so Daniel's got that one switched over. Uh, we have a motion to approve our agenda for today. I'll make the motion to approve the agenda. Okay. I second. Okay, we have a motion to approve from Tyler and a second from Drew. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say no. Okay, last thing that we want to do before we jump into projects. Uh, just remind everybody this is our waterfowl slash upland. <laughs> Uh, meeting and so we run this similarly to our previous meeting for for uh, habitat maintenance and whatnot um, we ask our our waterfowl management area managers to come and they present kind of their overall maintenance budgets uh, and then specific line items projects then then they'll go through the, through those separately it's kind of how we operate um, there are upland projects in here as well that's part of part of what this meeting is for. Um, and one thing I have to say about Upland is, is there, there, there'll be a few Upland specific things, but, but really there's a lot of Upland things sprinkled amongst all of the other, you know, habitat and big game and projects. They often benefit each other. And so uh, you'll see a lot of it that there. So any questions about how this meeting is going to be run today? Or moving forward, last thing I'll mention is um, our next Habitat Council meeting will be combined with, with Blue Ribbon uh, Committee and will be a fisheries-based meeting uh, on let's see, what was it, March, March, 23rd. March 23rd at Farmington Bay Correct. Uh, in their meeting room. And so in the first part of that meeting, we'll be meeting together with the Blue Ribbon, Blue Ribbon Council uh, up till noon, and then in the afternoon, it'll be just us, Habitat Council, and, and Blue Ribbon will have a separate meeting. So that's how that will run. Okay. 
Any questions before we move forward on project? All right, we're gonna move ahead then. Okay, first project, uh, 5911 Farmington Bay Maintenance. And for any of you presenting, just guide me to where you wanna go in the database. Uh, and re remember to introduce yourselves too. Yeah, right. We're gonna rock this stepbrother style. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and yeah. So I'm the assistant manager at Farmington Bay. Started in 2015. I'm Jason Jones. I'm the Department of Bay Manager. I've been there since 2005. I was the assistant for 10 years and I've been the manager for about seven years. I didn't catch your name. David England. David England. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Let me just go to the next slide here. Yeah. So this project here is actually two projects that we used to do every year it was the upland and wetland enhancement project and the technician project. And starting last year, we just combined both of these. So this map here is a Farmington Bay, and it's hard to see on it, but all the blue lines there are all the dike lines that we spray in the spring. Now, the biggest part of this project is the technician side of it. Uh, we bring on two technicians in the spring, and they spray about 60 miles of dike, the dike that was here. Um, and a lot of times we have to hit it twice in the spring. Uh, next slide, please. So hit it. I won't do this next time, but hit it three times. There we go. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, the photo over there on your left, uh, we have over 241 water control structures and the technicians help clean all these out, maintain them, uh, put boards in, pull boards out, clean out muskrat holes, whatever. Um, the photo in the middle just shows last year, they did a bunch of improvements on fencing and gates and other things to just kind of make the facility look better. The photo here on the right is us working on the irrigation on our new facility. These guys are cleaning out the outhouses, cleaning up the shop, working on equipment. They're, they're doing it all. Next slide. They're also uh, helping us plant food plots there on the left. And then over here, um, Jason will get into some of the long reach track project, but when we're rebuilding some of these dikes, they're putting a lot of new material on the dike and we need to receive that. So the technicians are out receiving the dike. Next slide. Um, this was a project a couple of years ago, but just also trying to really show how diverse these guys are when we're working with them. We, uh, we tried something new with the rest area. We tried to uh, post it with buoys. And so here there are a couple photos of the guys making drags. Um, didn't work out as good as we were hoping it would, uh, but it did work out better than just putting the wood post out there and putting a sign on there, because then the wood post just falls in the water. We can't find them. The ice still moves the buoys. There's gonna be a project in the summer to move those buoys back in place, so. And then there's just some more photos of us posting those wood signs. Next slide. Uh, the technicians also help with goose banding, duck banding. Um, they're also uh, helping us in August with the big frag project. Um, so, I mean, I can't express enough how crucial these guys are for us with the workload that we have during the summer. Um, and I know you guys have probably heard Jason say this before, but uh, most of them right now started out as a seasonal technician. So it's kind of an investment for the, the division. Moving on. Okay, so this is the second big part um, that we're asking for, and that is two new 36 inch water control structures. These are on the bypass canal going into Turpin, and these are just one of the old steel structures and you can see on the photo on the left these steel structures just start to kind of degrade over time and they get holes water flows through those holes takes our dike out so we're asking to get two new 36 inch water control structures with uh hdp pipe that's gonna last forever essentially so next slide but yeah so here's kind of a breakdown of what we're asking for in this project the technician salary 29,000, the technician vehicle, five, uniform, including weeders, thousand, and then with the water control structures, 
with the HDP pipe 18. And then we're want, wanting to do some more upland mix on our dikes where we previously had a long reach track code repair some dikes. And we want to get some, some vegetation. And then irrigation supplies where our shrub rows and for our food plots and then herbicide. We're asking 25% uh, from habitat and 75 federally. All right, any questions? Yeah, when you're doing the uh, the upland seed mix, is that also to provide nesting cover along the sides of the dikes? And how does that mesh with uh, with the herbicide spraying that you're doing? Yeah, so um, I did a full grass mix because right now, yeah, we're getting a lot of white top. And so I was thinking if we do just a grass mix, we could kind of not worry about all the uh, broad leaves, you know, or just uh, drift spray drift and killing some of the forbs that you know are expensive to put in the seed mix. So we'll try to get some grass on there and then we'll just be able to spray 2,4-D and try to get a good handle on some of the the broad leaf weeds. So and we are trying to improve some of the dike lines. I think it's a little harder than doing some of the upland areas that we need to improve. We're upland limited, you know, but there are some areas we'd like to improve. And like Dave said, we're trying to move towards a grass mix so that we're not accidentally spraying Safe brush or some other things that, that we might have planted in there just to make mix easier for ourselves. So it starts getting expensive. Um, okay. you know, when we start adding a lot of those forbs to there and you know try to do the best that we can, but I'm just worried that when we're trying to treat all the weeds that are on the dike right now, we're also killing all the 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 weed the plants we just you know, put out there. So yeah. So I assume a lot of your nesting activity occurs on the dikes themselves, doesn't it? Yeah, we don't have a lot of upland habitat, so yeah. most of the nesting that happens at Farmington is on the dike. And plus erosion control too. If we don't get, you know, some grasses on there or some vegetation, then these wind storms that we have just gonna do all the work that the maintenance crew just did and put it back in the water. So. It wasn't mentioned on here, but does this also include predator management activities? Yes, the technicians do a lot of that. Yep. Yeah, we have. They do predator management. Wildlife Services does predator management. So, yeah, yes, yeah, so I think they got things. sixty last year. Sixty, right? Which is correct. Yeah, sixty. Yeah, our technicians good job. <laughs> That's mostly live traps. For a second. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Do we have a motion on this one? I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second. Okay. I've got a motion from Justin and a second from ben. Steve. Ben. ben. Sorry, ben. ben. All right. Everybody in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. All right. Motion carries. Okay. Second one Farmington Bay Dike Line Restoration. Okay, uh, just a disclaimer, I was up half the night wondering if my house was going to blow away, and this is sort of <laughs> relevant to this project here. Um, for, quite, for quite a few years, managers, we've been trying to do a lot of native plantings on the side of our dikes to kind of and We still want to be doing those kind of things. We want to plant native vegetation on our dike lines. We don't want to cover them in riprap and those kind of things. However, there's places and this project's related to the Long Reach uh, project I'm going to talk about. They're, they kind of go hand in hand. There's places we go back to every year and repair the dikes, and they wash back in the water. Last night during this one storm, I'm sure we took a lot of damage at Farmington Bay. This happens to be on turbine, and you just get some. If we go out and do the work, it falls back. In, it's back in the water. And you can just kind of see, you know, these steep cuts here. Now, if we're going to keep renting the track out and do this work year after year, that's just not very smart. And we want to keep doing the native plantings, like I said, but there's places that we identified in this project that we want to cobble. And I've, I've got a picture, I think, in the next slide of a project we just finished. Okay, well, it's in a second. Let me just point these out. If you're not familiar with Farmington Bay, this is the turpin unit. This is going to head north. This whole section here, major damage from wind and boats. And then all these winds, crazy windstorms we've been having with the 
uh, wind comes down from the mountains right here has just really been wreaking havoc on this is what we call the state canal. Comes in from the Jordan River from the south here and comes down this way, but we take a lot of damage here from wind and erosion, especially it just seems like these wind storms have been getting pretty crazy the last 12 years. So um, this project is to have our maintenance crew um, cobble these sections of dike. So put another picture on there. Okay, so we just finished a Till Lake restoration project where we had the same kind of problem. We tried to shore the, this dike up with some uh, hard stem bull rush plantings and things like that, and it just wasn't working out. So this is a habitat project that's just barely finished up. This is kind of what I'm going for on some of these sections um, that we're losing. And I just, you know, your ability to manage the habitat out there is like only as good as your infrastructure, I believe. So um, this project pretty straightforward. We need the we need to cobble sections of dike so they'll last. Okay, so we're asking for $115,000 for this project. 25% um, is coming from Sports and Fish and Wildlife, and the other 75% we asked to come from Federal Aid. Um, and we're, we're kind of relying on our maintenance crew to do this job for us. I did get a bid from England Construction on a small section of like 8,000 feet of this, and it was a ridiculous price. So, you know, we've kind of got to get the cobble and have our crew do the work along with the other work that we need them to do. So that's about it for this project. I, I've identified all the areas on the, the mapping program, but basically there's a section on Turpin and there's sections up on the state canal that we feel like we need to do this project. All right, any questions? I've just got one. On the SFW dollars, are those expo funds or banquet funds or what are those exactly? I am not sure. I, I just talked to Matt about it last week and Angie went in and changed the budget from Habitat Council to SFW. Okay. It'll probably have to be expo 150 or 350. Yeah, I'd agree. I can confirm with them once we get the other things going. Okay. The full list. Well, the Habitat Council funds were, were removed from the project. We're still bringing it through this process to to okay. award the funding from the expo permit. So it's great. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Do we have a motion on this one? Yeah, I'll move that we tentatively approve it. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion from Jack and a second from Steve. Steve. <laughs> His name's memorized one of these times. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Trust Eric. me. Eric, you'll get to know Steve's name. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a way you want the name to for you? Um, Is he scanned or how do you want that tag? Um, you can go ahead and just voice it. Randy, yeah, that, that's fine. Just um, say if there, yeah, if you oppose it, then for sure say something if you're opposing a project. Yeah, no, I'll speak up. Okay. Yeah, no, that'll be fine. Thanks, Randy. Okay. Next project, State Canal Control Engineering and Design. So that's what the agenda says. But on, on our uh, PowerPoint, we've got the track of project, which really makes sense to... Okay, we're accidents. switching them. Okay. It's related to cycling improvements, basically. Okay. So this is the Waterfly Management Area Cooperative Long Reach Traco Project. This was a project where all the different waterfowl manager management areas lease a traco and we share this traco. Um, basically, back in the day, we would have a guy that ran a drag line, if you guys know what that is. That's how we, we would build and repair dikes. I know most of you are probably familiar with the fact that we have to continually repair the dikes on the waterfowl management areas or clean out um, siltation as the water comes in, it's dropping in a lot of sediment where it's taking out sections of the dike. And as I kind of just showed you, we're rebuilding sections and then we're, then we're losing those sections. However, it's super important that we have a piece of machinery that can travel around to the different areas that we can repair dike with. And you need one of these long reach trackos to do it since there's no more, more drag lines um, or nobody to run a drag line. And we, this is a great project. We you know, it just, it shuttles around 
to the different areas with our maintenance crew. And one of the maintenance crew guys pretty much sits on there and runs it. Rich has some grazers that provide some in-kind service and, and run the track out because they, they have a lot of experience. So he'll let those guys run it as, along with our uh, maintenance crew guys. So it gets quite a bit of use and we think it's a really important piece of machinery to have around. <laughs> And I think I yeah this this is some more section of turf and dike and I mean when they fall off into the water like that they have to be repaired really the dike you know should kind of be a nice angled section of dike and um, this is up at one of Rich's places where I think he's building a unit with this thing right Rich no it's kind of the channel it was same like channel we built so, I mean. We, we've used it to build little sections of dike, clean channels, and repair dike. And it just, it's got nonstop work to do pretty much at our areas. So, all right. So, we asked for 54000 for this project, and there, there is some figure in there for that in kind service. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. The, the track I lease, the fuel, and the transport, you have to call Wheeler Machinery and have them transport this on a semi. To the different areas so we've got some money for fuel transport and then the lease itself you guys have any questions i move to approve i'll second okay we have a motion from drew and a second from tyler all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. hey randy before you move on can i ask a question about just dykes and I want everybody to keep in mind this is from a guy who works in the aquatic section with a rich history of people doing things on the cheap. And, you know, the dike repair, you had mentioned that you're, you're doing it in-house because it's too expensive to, to bid it out. And I, I respect that. But you know, if, you're, if you're repairing it every, every year or every two years or every time there's a wind event, is it worthwhile investing some money in some engineering for a more permanent solution? Well, that's what I think cobble, and it's kind of a permanent solution. I mean, I just don't. I have a, rebuilding the dike is kind of a simple thing. Like, let's rebuild it and, and put some cobble out there on it. I mean, I just I didn't really think it was a. When I heard the bid for how much it would cost to do eight thousand feet of dike, it was like half a million dollars. I just I don't know. Felt like we should do it in house. It, I don't think we need to engineer sloping and cobble, but. I could be wrong. I mean, other managers have an opinion on that. How long have you had some sections cobbled? Well, this is kind of, we like I said, we've been kind of moving towards trying to do native plantings for quite a few years. We just find in some places with these high winds, we can't do that. Now, historically, you'll find riprap and tires and all kinds of crap out there from, from the old days. And we try to move away from that. Um, cobbling sections of dike, I mean, we've cobbled small sections before, but the biggest section, I've seen cobble. This is the one I just did, and that's after trying a lot of different things and watching that just fail. But, you know, I'm not going to build a unit and have it fail. So that's why I went to the cobble. Again, the small sections you've done, they've been holding up. Uh, well, those sections we we never went as hard as I did on that till like you know we never put it. And I figured out to do enough cobble that it's six feet tall and six feet out and kind of a triangular section, kind of like they did on England. So. I just think that's what we need to do. There's no way I can see that that's not going to hold up in the wind, you know. So I'm pretty confident about what we did until like, which was engineered. You know, so the reason I reason I asked the question is is uh, you know we have folks in our section that are fisheries folks, not not dam builders, and we have hatchery people that raise fish and they're trying to do things that they really don't have the expertise to do, and we end up doing it again and again and again and again. And that's why, you know, maybe it's worth spending some money and hiring somebody just to, you know, provide advice that, that does this for a living. Yeah. Yeah, maybe an option is to see how this goes and if if you're if it's still failing and then you know, maybe maybe we do or work with an engineer on a consultation basis to just on the design part, maybe even on the labor. But honestly, after all these years, I think we're trained to work on a small budget as waterfront management areas. Yeah, yeah, and that's that is how it is. So, people gonna do with do with what we have. So, okay, okay. So that 
<clears throat> project was approved and we're gonna move up a line back to on the agenda 5933 State Canal. Is that right? Okay. This is a canal that sort of the project that I'm gonna to have to give you guys a little background information on. If you're not familiar with Farmington Bay at all, Farmington Bay Waterfront Management Area is maybe 10 miles 10 north of us. It's basically fed by the Jordan River. The Jordan River is cut at 21st South and a portion of it goes down the Goggins Drain and a portion of it goes north towards the Duck Clubs and Farmington Bay Waterfront Management Areas. In the 30s, when the area was built, the state embarked on some right-of-way agreements um, to get permission to go through private property. And as part of those right-of-way agreements, we agreed to do a few things, like maintain the structure we own and maintain a few bridges. The structure, I'm not even sure when it was built, but it might have been in 1938 or 1940. This is this structure helps us split the water between Farmington Bay and New State Duck Club. We're supposed to maintain a 50-50 split of water. Um, it's a stop log structure in the State Canal, which is deep and dangerous. See, that's Dave there hopping out on the pillars. You have to hop on top of the pillars to manage the structure. Bo, oh, the New State Manager, does a lot of the management for us because it's nice because this is actually a mile and a half south of our border. We own it. But it's goes through private property. You can see it's not maintained, it's totally degraded, it's dangerous. This is where the water goes around the structure, so it's not really functional. It does that on both sides. I'm too fat to jump out on that. If if Dave broke his leg, I mean, I mean, I mean it needs to be replaced. This is for the engineering <laughs> and design of the structure. Um, we agreed to maintain the structure as part of this right-of-way agreement that goes back to 1938. And, we renewed it in 1981, and we've got to figure out how much it's going to cost to replace it. And it's got to be a functional structure where we could actually stop the water if we wanted to and send it one way or the other. We can't really do that right now. We couldn't totally stop the water to Farmington Bay, and we might want to do that for one reason or another. Um, anyway, we just made a functional structure. So we need to in engineer it and see what we really need. Is this what's referred to as the Burnham Dam, or is that something? This is right next to the Burnham Dam. So we've asked for $40,000 to hire an engineering company. I've been kind of talking with Eric on, on how much he thought we needed to, to spend. And that's, that's, he and I came up with that figure. And it's, it's 25% you know, from Habitat Council and the right best federal aid. So. I think you're husky. Not bad. Thanks, man. I just wanted to make, I just wanted to get the point across about my man. I don't think I can jump out on those. And you then you know you've got to get the boards out of there. And that's a deep you don't want to fall in that crap because it's it's probably got bottomless mud and you know. Anyway, it needs it just needs to be replaced. So after the engineering, who who ultimately has responsibility for this? We do. Yeah. We, we find stuff like that out when we get into those old agreements. We had a bridge fall in the state canal and the burn dam was like, hey, this is you guys, because they know, they know we're responsible for it. And they're like, really? So we look at those old agreements and you're like, oh yeah, we're responsible for several things down there we agree to maintain, so. That's gonna be an expensive project. Right, I'm guessing it'd be like a half a million dollars, I guess. Because if we're gonna replace it, we should replace it with something more automated, something that tells us how much flow is coming through there, something much easier to manage. So, something where somebody doesn't have to jump out on a pillar, pull the boards. With, you know, we pull up boards like this, but if we can get away from it with the infrastructure, we're going to want to do that. So, especially on our main feed. This is the main source of water for Farmington Bay. Right. So. Any other questions? Okay. I move that we approve it. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion from Jack, a second from uh, Justin. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Okay, motion carries. Um, next one, Allison, do you know if Heather is still available? Um, no, she's not. Let's so we'll push it. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, next project, 6036. Uh, Salt Creek WMA and Bear River Canal Company. 
version of the uh, No, I don't have this one. So let's just go ahead and pull the map portion of this. My name is Chad Cranny. I'm the manager of the public shooting ground, Salt Creek and Locomotive Springs. Um, this is a pretty straightforward project where the Fair River Canal Company is part of a larger project where the canal company is looking at upgrading a whole bunch of their main diversion structures throughout their system. They're looking at upgrading a total of 14 of them. Basically, these upgrades are going to improve the efficiency of, of water flow and delivery, but also upgrade capacity to all these structures. And that's kind of what we're excited about. And really this uh, kind of affects two, or directly affects us through two main structures. One to the north here, which is the, the Salt Creek Spillway, and then one to the south, which they call the Home Green Spillway. Um, <clears throat> so this one to the north uh, is what, is where we get all of our canal shares. So it flows through that diversion structure down to the head uh, of Salt Creek Spring, and then it meanders on down Salt Creek into the WMA, and then we can divert it wherever we want from there. So we've got just, just over 119 water shares that goes through that diversion. And right now it is at maximum capacity. So we cannot, in the future, buy any more water shares and send it through that structure as it sits right now. So <clears throat> we definitely like to see this get upgraded so Eric can do his job and buy some more water shares for us and we can actually get them delivered. Um, <clears throat> there's also some other added benefits to this. There's just a couple pictures of the structure, the salting structure itself. You can see it, it's fairly old, it's a big. Uh, spillboard, um, screw gate. You can see this small little green gate here. Basically, that's just a pipe that they installed to deliver our water shares. And again, it's, it's a maximum capacity. So we're looking to upgrade all these areas with pretty sophisticated stuff, automation, telemetry, um, real-time measuring systems and whatnot. So that's gonna benefit us also and the fact that a lot of times, or a few times throughout the year, they need to dump a lot of water down that Salt Creek diversion. Um, they don't always let us know. So Arlo and I go out one day and we've got water everywhere. High water, potential of uh, damaging some of our infrastructure and whatnot. So we scramble around for half a day or even a day, trying to get rid of this water, diverting it where we need, we're completely bypassing it down onto public shooting grounds. And then when they shut the water off, they don't let us know as well. <laughs> so we go out and the next thing you know, everything's dropping like crazy. We've got exposed mud. That leads to potential of increased cattail, Phragmites expansion. It also doesn't help the production of our pond weed. So <clears throat> this will help us look at those real time numbers, be able to see what's going on, communi communicate with the canal company a lot more, um, and just be able to manage these surges and water levels a lot a lot better. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the finance section. And so we're asking for 25,000 through the Habitat Council. Um, this is a over $2 million project overall. And if we go down to the funding, I realized that this morning I should have changed this. So I did ask for some, some PR money. I'm just the habit of whenever we do stuff on water paddle areas, we're asking for PR money. <laughs> but this is, the canal company is already asking for some federal dollars through BOR and RCS for this project. So really we need to change that to no PR money and all Habitat Council. They need our, they need our share to match their They are, They would like to do that, yes. So instead of 18.7 and 6,200, it's 25. 25. Yes. And with that, I'd also like to propose that we change the, the funding source through the Habitat Council to the breakdown. I think I just had it as 100% water power. 10% uh, upwind and water power. Okay. I, I think we should also add in some non game there. I mean, a lot of what we do out on the water power area is, is beneficial to non game species. And they are on the species list. 
like you would suggest? Um, 10 to 15% more from non gain. That's really all I have, and pretty straightforward. We would really like to see these upgrades so we can potentially get more water and manage the water more efficiently when we're getting it. Hey, hey, two quick questions for you. Um, yeah. One, what's the potential for actually getting more water out there? Well, there's always the potential when shares come up for sale. Um, of course, it depends on how much those shareholders are asking and whether or not we got funding. We just bought some shares, what, about a year ago, Eric? You know, 22 or four shares, somewhere around there. So it, the potential is there for sure. Okay. And then the other question is, is there a way to get better communication with the canal company so that we're not always trying to scramble around this issue? Yeah, we've been trying. And I, do, I will say, since I've been there the past five, six years, it has gotten better. Um, I think what happens, these ditch riders, when they have high water, they just got so much going on, they, they forget to make a phone call. And I get it. I do that, too. So um, it's gotten better, but there's still times where we go out and we're just like, man, why didn't they let us know about this? Has that grant been approved? The one that... No, um, no they're still working on it. Well, there's funding hit at the time yes, that approval yeah. should be so they happening? Potentially are looking at upgrading these two structures we're talking about. A year from now, okay. that's great. Is it? I mean, is implementation going to happen, or is it going to be engineering, and then a year later? It's implementation. They're planning on doing construction on these structures a year from now. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on this one? All right. We have a motion. Motion. Tentatively approved. Okay. Thanks, Ben. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Ben and a second from Jack. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Mm. Not opposed. Motion carries. Okay. Next one, um, Ogden Bay WMA East Dyke restoration. Go ahead, Rich. Okay. My name is Rich Hansen. I'm the manager of Ogden Bay Power Stone Hill Crane Block Bell Management Area. I started with the division in about 2002. And I've been in waterfowl management uh, my entire career. So mm -hmm. this project uh, might sound a little familiar. Because back in 2019, we actually got a bunch of boulders um, to to rebuild this east dike, um, yeah, which is right, right to the left of the culture. First of all, um, the bad thing is. I severely underestimated the amount that we needed, and I, I didn't realize how deep it, the, the river was there. So the maintenance crew fixed a half a mile. Um, I thought we had enough boulders to go the entire length of it to, to rip out that. But like what, what Jason was, was talking about, we just get so much erosion from the wind, and then boats run up there to go get up the river, so that constant wave action during the hunting season is just... Every week you can see about, you know, six inches to a foot of the dike just roll down into the river. So um, if we lose this dike, then we will be unable to control the water on all of our day. So that dike gives us the ability, and there are some good pictures here of what the erosion is happening. You just see how, how fresh that is. I mean, you got wheat grass just falling in, so you know that was fairly recent. It's getting to the point where we don't even try this site anymore. We go the long way around on the, the west side because we just don't know when it's so undercover. We don't know when it's going to fall. So this is the half. This is an example, a portion of the half that was done by our maintenance crew. Um, I think they might have gone one one uh, row too high, but they're about three rows down. And I was thinking it was only take two rows for the whole thing, so we had to use like four times the amount in that stretch that I thought. So. I'm this asking was done last year, Rich. What's that? This was done last this was year. 2019. Right. That's, that's, I think that's one of the project was we got the boulders and the maintenance crew did it. Um, some news that I just got um, Monday though, ducks I'm gonna put in for a knock a grant to work on this dike and another dike that's out there that's eroded just as bad. Uh, they said they think they got it. So I don't know if we if we can get the 
I'm just asking for the, the material, the boulders here. If they do get that, then they would do all the engineering and fit out the construction, and we would be able to, to fix that entire dike and then another dike that's about eroding away as well. So yeah, I'm asking for 160,000 for the for the boulders. Um, talk to Troy and Matt, and they said to to go for the the expo the 350 expo expo funds, and yeah, we would just have it all delivered there, and then hopefully Ducks Unlimited to gets that. If they don't, then the maintenance crew will just continue. And, and it takes a little bit of time because we only get them for three to six months at a time, and we've kind of got to prioritize triage what what's failing on the area. So it might be if we get the boulders in place, it might be a couple of years before it's done if the maintenance crew does it. But if Ducks Unlimited got that knocker grant, it would all be done in the next year. Any questions? When will you know if that grant comes through? They said they would know the next month. I just had the same comment as the other project. I, I think, you know, at some point, some engineering would be helpful. I think it'd be great if, not, if they, we've got to knock it because they would have to provide all the engineering and then we kind of have a footprint to go off of on a lot of our infrastructure. All right. I'll make the motion to approve it. Okay, second. Okay, we've motion from Tyler, a second from Drew. All in favor say aye. Aye. Be opposed, say nay. All right, motion carries. Next one, uh, FY 23 Northern Utah WMA CARP control. All right. Each year on the waterfowl management areas, we choose one of the WMAs to have a CARP treatment. Every single one of the WMAs is fed by water that, that has a lot of CARP in it. And over time, um, concentrations of carp increase, the turbidity increases, and the sago pond weed, which is the, the number one vegetation we can produce for migrating waterfowl out there, production goes down. So, so we need clear water for the sago pond weed to be able to photosynthesize and grow. So basically, Last year, we did a bunch of stuff out on Farmington Bay. We did some on Turpin. We did uh, Doug Miller, South Crystal, and then some stuff also up on State Canal. Um, Turpin is, is what we're talking about doing if we get this one this next year. So this year, we are doing uh, Howard Slough. And the nice thing is that Howard Slough and Bay, Colton and I have been able to actually put some screens in to prevent carp from reinvading the area after uh, the treatment. And we're getting like what, five years per treatment before we can get much turbidity. A little, we're just using rebar in all of our water control structures and we have to clean them every day. So it, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's worth it. I mean, Sago production has been unreal on our area. So, I mean, that's a picture just a little snapshot of one little area. It looks like that all the way across the areas for a couple of years after we complete these projects. So that's that was a good picture of how turbid these these units are. And you can you can see carp moving, and you don't see any of the sagos in the other pictures. And if we removed all those carp, that pond right there, we we've, we've done it before. That pond looks exactly like the the picture with all the sagos. So. It's it's pretty simple fix. Just remove the carp, and we get the sago, and we get tens of thousands of waterfowl these days. So picture cool. We you know we we all get together as waterfowl group and, and just put out. I think the last one we did in Bay, we used like twenty one different drips. So it's it was really intensive, but really successful as well. So the last couple of years, we've asked for sixteen thousand dollars. We've got the really big ones out of the way. So we, we lowered that to 12,000 this year. We don't need quite as much road note. Um, so that's really 12,000. Um, talked to Matt and Troy and they said Expo Phone 350 fund would be great to use for this. So. Where do you get your road now? Steve Regan, got the state contract. All right. 
Yeah. yeah um, you know, I probably asked this before and you probably explained it before and I just forgot, but you know, is it possible on some of these areas to kind of do a, like a master plan and come up with, because I know on the South shore, it's the same thing. You know, we, we treat it with road known and I swear within six months, it looks, you know, you've got carp moving ahead of you, like, you know, porpoises in front of a ship or something, but is, is it possible to do some kind of like global, you know, regional thing where you look at the hydrology and just blitz the whole area, put in the screens and hope that. If they've done it in other areas on, on big rivers, so I'll put big screens in and are yeah. big, some kind of, I drew it no better than me what they put in to prevent carp from coming in. But it is something to be done. I would imagine it would be very expensive, but uh, you know, like, like I said, it's really a lot of work on Ogden Bay and Howard Slough to put these screens in and clean them every day. But one of the things we've done is we've got uh, guys out there that have their cattle that are grazing frag. So one of their job duties every day when they go check their cows is also to clean all of our screens. And, you know, we give them a little bit of in-kind credit for doing that. So it makes it so it's not quite as intensive for, for what we're doing. I like the idea. I mean, if you if we could do something on the Jordan River, it would it would be incredible how much uh, Sago could be produced on all the flow of that part of the There's yeah. a number of self-cleaning screens out there that, that are really functional. Uh, you know, they're going to cost, but it's probably in the long run, probably save you money on the on the you know the carp removal that you guys do and headache. You know, I, I could get you some some lease concepts or some designs. We're building one right now on starvation reservoir, and uh, and you know it's self cleaning. So you know you really the labor's not there. Uh, there's already one on Red Fleet Reservoir that takes care of that you know that outlet as well. So there's I've seen some in Wyoming that are really functional for just this kind of thing. That's good to know. Yeah, if you can forward that information along, that would be okay. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, because I know I know where I am. It's like you know, every three years we treat, but the treatment's only good for like the first year, it seems like, and then you know, it just seemed like you know, maybe if kind of everyone gathered together, we could come up with some kind of global global solution to the problem. Yeah. Maybe it's impossible. Maybe it's like, you know, eradicating cockroaches. Well, right, now. <laughs> right now, there's going to be, I mean, a bunch of legislative money, potentially, uh, for Great Salt Lake. Yeah. There's a way to come together now when, when money's available. This might be, aside from Get this project. Get the Jordan River above the Gog and, you know, and just filter that whole river out. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. If you put a bunch in the surplus canal in the Jordan River and nuke the whole thing, get it over with. But, you know, it's, I mean, you probably need to have to put a fish screen in because everything coming yep. down from the Jordan. Absolutely. Drew, are there any of those uh, screens you're talking about in place right now in Utah? Starvation is in, it's in, we've already designed it, it's being constructed this spring and through the summer. Uh, the one in Red Fleet's done. And on the upper green, Wyoming put one in that I thought was a fantastic. Uh, it's basically, a, an inverted uh, calder and it, it has just a rotating thing to keep the vegetation off and it takes the entire green river wow. water and so it's it's it was pretty fantastic i took some pictures of that because i think it's worth you know worth looking at so i'll get you those those designs and thanks you know just, just something that comes to my mind is we see jason's proposal having to redo that structure and state canal and i was thinking maybe that's something to look at with the engineering of that new structure for states now, yeah. or possibly a fish See how it goes, or just look into it. Yeah. Are the, the Utah chubs out there beneficial? I mean, do you want to preserve those or? Okay. All right. I didn't know if there were any good fish in that. Occasionally, <laughs> you see it, you know, if you yeah. have the trout or catfish from probably Bountiful Pond. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting, like in the, you know, at Ogden Bay. And the more interesting thing was at Howard Slough. When, when we treated that about four or five years ago, we, we killed like eight wipers that were <laughs> good size. And, you know, a couple of what, 28 inch catfish. So, so we've seen everything like in, you know, in Ogden Bay. Everything that's in Pine View and Willard Bay comes downstream. So we've seen everything from tiger, muskie, to crappie, perch, wipers. You, you did it. Yeah, it's very. I mean, it's less than, way less than 1%.
We may need to add some sport fish dollars to that. <laughs> <laughs> if you have access, we have fish with them. Okay. Any but, other questions? No, but I'll make a motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. Okay, thank you. I'll second. Okay, motion from Justin, the second from Jack. All in favor say aye. 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 Say no. Motion carries. Okay, next one. 6029 Ogden Bay WMA Upland Wetland Enhancement. Yeah, I put PowerPoint together, um, kind of like we did last year, just talking about what we have done in this fiscal year. So I'll, I'll go through that really fast. Uh, okay, so right now we've got uh, number 5763. It's a water control structure replacement project. We have this old bridge that like, kind of got condemned. We're not supposed to be driving over. We took a four wheeler over there, and that picture it looks like, but um, we can't take our trucks over. So, what we did is we had the, the maintenance crew work on that. They removed the old railroad tie bridge, and this is what it was looking like after the removal. The water control structure was good, so we just needed to replace the, the bridge top so we could get over it. So next slide. So Steve's got these four and a half foot wide. He, he just made these steel foundations, and then he ended up pouring them yesterday. So we'll fill in the side, and this was just done yesterday. So he'll he'll backfill and then we'll have that structure all, all replaced and done next. Um, the other structures have been built, but they haven't been replaced yet. So we'll uh, we'll hopefully get that done in the next couple of months. Next. Okay, on 5701, we talked about that. Um, Colton and I have been working on drawing the ponds down that we want to treat. And we plan on doing it the next month or whenever the, the water's low enough, it's low enough. So uh, there are the south and Palma, we've never been able to treat at Howard Slough. But last year, the maintenance crew replaced two water control structures, and we can finally draw that pond down enough to treat it. So really excited to get that one done. Next. Okay, the Alpha Wetland Enhancement Project, uh, 5651. We had a great summer. Our technicians really worked hard with uh, irrigation of all of our, our food plots. Um, these areas get just a ton of pressure during the pheasant hunt. It's one group after another. North of headquarters, there's anywhere from 50 to as many as 80 vehicles on opening day and then every Saturday after that. It's incredible the number of pressure that that little area gets. Um, we never have any, we, we only get compliments on our food plots. I mean, people really like the opportunity to go through cornfields, sorghum fields, and, and just feel like they're hunting wild pheasants. And, and you know, they're we're releasing a lot, so there's a lot of success there. Um, within this project, we also have our technicians funded, just like what Jason did. And those guys did a pretty good job of covering that breakdown. So, you know, they help with everything. That was a, a carp exposure that we, we were experimenting with on on the, the east side of the, the dike replacement area, or the dike area that I just presented on. Next. Um, we use surface irrigation pipe for, for our irrigation. Um, we picture the technicians preparing a plot to plant. Next. There's corn coming up, and then, you know, the, the final product there, we we produce a lot more corn than what wild pheasants we have out there, but um, it, the, the corn provides a lot better cover for the pheasants if there's a lot of snow. So we, we've started raising a lot more corn. And I was concerned at first that it was going to be too tall and stuff by the pheasant hunt to prevent a, a problem with pheasant hunters, a, you know, it's a danger where they'd be shooting, but it, it seems to always break down enough by the pheasant hunt to where, where it's safe out there. So next. Um, last fall, we planted way over 100, probably about 120 acres. Um, we 
distant, and then we had to plant with a seed spreader because all that October rains we got uh, made it so we couldn't get it the rangeland drill to any of the plots that we did. So hopefully the seed spreader will work. Um, I'm really excited because this is the first time um, since I got to Ogden May 2015 that we've had really good fall moisture to plant. In. So I'm optimistic. Hopefully we get a lot of spring moisture and, and get a lot of growth out there. Yeah, cool. And we planted on, on the left, we planted, I think, 700 plants that day. Uh, we make a V ditch down so we can irrigate these. And, you know, we usually irrigate them for about three years until the roots are really well established. And then in this photo, we were working with, uh, I think, Scott from the Forest Service with his little contraption transplanter. And that was unreal. We planted over a thousand plants that day in what, like two to three hours? Where normally it would take us a half a day with probably 30 to 40 volunteers to get that many in. So that was really exciting. We tried a different, couple different areas. We tried one area where we dished and then we actually broadcast, spread a bunch of grass and stuff there. And then we planted several hundred just in an area where there was pretty good establishment of grasses already to see how they did there. So. Really excited to work with with him and monitor these and see how how successful they are. Next, and then the technicians also help with with dove banding and then and do some duck banding. So that's kind of their reward for all their hard work in irrigating and planting and water management. Next, okay, on to. Thanks for that, Rich. Yes, sure. So, with uh, 6029, it's very similar to what Jason already presented. We've got we've got all of our uh, equipment, Randall. I guess the difference between us and, and them is. When I got there in 2015, our tra our 20 year old tractor caught fire and burned up. So I asked to get that replaced. I got denied. They said try the try renting a tractor every year, which is amazing. So we rent two tractors. We rent them. Uh, I think we get get them in April and then again in October. So there's a little bit of um, overlap there in October and November when we're planting all the perennial planting. So we have two tractors going at the same time. We've been able to do a lot with them between all of our, our dike mowing and then all of the, the perennial planting we're doing. And then to have them in April so we can do all of our food plots, uh, really convenient. And uh, we just love the, the rental because uh, looking back at the budget prior to 2015, there were some years that there was five to $8,000 spent just on the maintenance and keeping that 20 year old tractor running. So it, it's just nice having reliable equipment. Um, in the budget, we've got five thousand dollars for motor pool for the the technician truck, and then we asked for fifty five hundred dollars for GBRC seed for these perennial plantings. Um, soil amendments. Um, I grew up farming and I learned at a young age that if you don't give put the soil amendments and give the plants the nutrients that they need to grow, that they're not going to be as successful as they can be, and see fuel for the tractors we, we do a lot of irrigation and on all i think we had eight food plots last year and so we, we spend all that forty five hundred dollars on fuel between the tractor work and and keeping the pumps running and then we spend about ten thousand dollars on new trees and shrubs just woody vegetation out there is critical to get what pheasants and quail we have over winter Okay, so 29,000, I think we're consistent on all three of the areas asking for, for the technician money. It's two two six-month wildlife techs, and typically they come on 1st of April and, and go to October during the growing season when we need them the most. For funding, I talked to Matt Troy again, and they were good with 350 Expo funds being used as the match. And 
and like Chad said before, I think federal aid eligible. I, I put the $2,000 of in kind because with those shrub plantings, we always have a lot of volunteers and I think it's important to use the, the volunteer match when we can. All right, questions? Kind of on topic. Transplanting quail up there for several years now. Yeah. Are the hunters finding them? Is there any return on that investment? Yeah, they're finding them, but quail are interesting. And as soon as there's pressure, it seems like they go for the houses or to headquarters. They'll be scattered all north of headquarters where it said there was like 50 to 80 vehicles. We'll have a couple hundred quail there. And by the time the pheasant hunt gets there, but the youth have a lot of opportunity. They do a lot of missing. Seems like all that pressure pushes them back to headquarters area. So we're we're sitting at what 100, 150 quail right around headquarters right now. Um, working with SFW, we've got some surrogators. We want to try putting quail on the surrogators this year. I want to release them right around headquarters area to imprint on all these wild quail and just get that first couple months of survival and, and know how under. And then I would like to try to trap and relocate to areas that they can't be hunted and areas that we want them on the WMA and just see how that works for this next year. Trying to think outside the box and provide more opportunity. That's good. You, you know, I, I actually was going to ask a question kind of along those lines. Um, and when I looked at the map on this project, I hope I'm remembering correctly, but it seems like you had... Um, areas scattered throughout that you're wanting to hit. Am I remembering correctly? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, throughout all of Ogden Bay and Howard Saloon. Okay. Now, the reason I bring that up is along the lines of that last question is, and maybe this is an unfair question at this point, but are there any projects with the property owners in the surrounding areas? Because having little islands of... Uh, be it the released pheasants or the quail or whatever, small islands aren't going to survive and aren't going to thrive. Is there any way that we're looking at expanding this to get in, to have some private property um, projects going with owners buying into that? I haven't explored that because everywhere that we, that we do release quail is contiguous with Ogden Bay. Ogden Bay is 19,000 acres and Howard Slew is 3,200. And so within that area, um, all these, er they, they can go back and forth on the WMA. Granted, they, they do end up on private property and there probably are some things that could be done. I, I could certainly look at that. Oh, and like you said, it's just my concern is like what you're pointing out, like with the quail that I know have been released out there, they disappear as soon as the pressure gets there. I mean, they're not dumb. You know, they go into the safe zones and the pheasants, I think mostly the pheasants that are being shot out there are just the put and take pheasants, aren't they? They are. These last, what, three summers we've had have been so hot and dry that we'll, we'll see We'll see the broods come and, and, you know, they'll hatch and whatnot. And then we just haven't seen the, the grasshoppers or the bugs. I don't know that they're surviving to get to the fall. There, there are a good number of hens out there and there's a lot of good seed there. We just need the right conditions for, for once to see what really ha can, can happen. Okay. I, I love what you're doing. I just would lo love to be able to see if we can expand it somehow. And I, and that's beyond this meeting, I suppose. And, and, you know, the other thing with those perennial plantings is we've really spread them out now. I mean, we're we're thinking outside the box of, on the uplands and getting out on some, some of the high ground in the wetlands even and, and disking those up and planting those and seeing really good results. So I, I, I think talking to some adjacent landowners would, would also help with survival and, and keep some birds pretty, you know, adjacent to the area anyways. Okay, awesome. Appreciate it. So um, these projects, do they uh, tell me about the effect on nesting cover for waterfowl and shorebirds? Yeah, that, that's our goal. Is, is it's all inclusive. Pretty much what I would say half of the acres we do is within a few hundred yards of the river. So nesting ducks can easily get to water um, with their broods. I, I think it's more beneficial for waterfowl actually than I do the uplands. Okay. Or upland birds. 
I, I, you know, I've seen some uh, some really depressing study results recently by Mike Conover up at Utah State. The, the study he was doing over the last couple of years, basically, mm -hmm. net success is like 2% or something. I mean, it's just abysmal. Last year was terrible. There was just, there was no precipitation when we needed it for things yeah. to grow. So everything was wide open. We did a lot of predator control still. We probably, between the muskrat trappers, wildlife services, and us, we probably still killed over 400 predators, I think. So we're killing the predators, but we are like a sink. I don't know what the Jason landowners are doing, but we remove them and, and, and they keep coming. So Yeah, well, if only there were a rope known for raccoons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure that study is at all comprehensive. We're, across the we're seeing a ton of area. Area. Well, we're seeing, we saw good brews last year, still when we were, yeah. when we were banding, and we're seeing a lot more. Yeah. So I don't know that. That study is a where really they're dragging those chain. chains to look for nests. Is they're working on the dikes, yeah. which is just a straight predator corridor. And we've got really good uplands that are off the dike at yeah. Ogden Bay and Salt Trick. I mean, it is depressed. I thought the same thing. I looked at that. I was like, that's horrible. Oh yeah, but they are. You know, they're just looking at the main predator corridor trap of areas. Yeah, and yeah. Not, they're not away from them where there probably is a lot higher success. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you're, it's something, you, you know, that, that study is getting out among the waterfowling communities. So you're probably going to be hearing a lot more about it. <laughs> well, if we could, I think if Mother Nature would cooperate, we would yeah. see those numbers go through the roof. We've just yeah. we've had the odds stacked against us for at least three, three years now. Sure. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Make a motion. I move to approve. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, a motion from Drew and a second from Steve. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, say nay. Okay, motion carries. Uh, next project <laughs> mitigation for Wilderness Spur WMA parking lot expansion project. All right, so my name is Colton Anderson. I've been uh, Rich's assistant for about seven years now. I started in 2015 in division. I was a technician for four years before that. I managed Willard Spur, WMA, and I'm an assistant at Logan Bay, Howard State, and Harold Creek. This project kind of deals with the project I presented last year, so for a few slides, you guys might recognize you much. Some background, Willersburg was created as a WMA in 2019 through the legislative session, and Vision and Wildlife now operates and fulfills the responsibilities for the WMA. Next slide. Here's a picture of Willersburg. There's kind of the, the yellow spots are the two access points of the parking areas. Both have pretty good issues. Next slide. So the issue with the West Launch is it's just a horrible road to get out there. If your boat, if your trailer in a boat out there, it takes half hour to 45 minutes to do it without beating the heck out of your equipment. Uh, it's also you've got a ton of vandalism. People are constantly having fires, uh, just littering, leaving couches and stuff. I haven't seen up in a few weeks to clean it up. It's it's horrible. Uh, this top picture is actually. The parking area. So, who wants to put on waders when you're standing in mud and, and water and all that? So, really, the West Launch just doesn't get used that much. It's it's in really rough shape, and we'd love to do something with it in the future. But uh, this East Launch was my main project last year. You can see the parking lot there is relatively small. It's only five vehicles, and it's taken up a lot. And uh, yeah, from there you have to park clear down the road. And walk close to a mile and a half in sometimes, creating a traffic nightmare or just safety hazards in general. Right, next slide. So, last year I proposed this parking area, which is going to be about an acre in size and should alleviate a lot of these stresses for people who want to access the old spur and, and utilize it. Um, yes, yeah, it should just make it a lot more enjoyable for people and easier access. Uh, next slide. 
So I got approval last year through this council and, and had the funds ready to go. And of course, uh, before we started, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and said, hold on, you guys need to have a mitigation site, mitigation plan in order before we can construct this parking lot. That's because we're going to be filling close to an anchor wetlands to put this parking lot. And it was really the only place that made sense because everywhere else is surrounded by private landowners. Uh, so, you can go to the next slide. But I an engineer been working with create a mitigation plan. Uh, we kind of located a spot at Autumn Bay that we thought would be really awesome to try to enhance the area. Go ahead and do the next slide. This is kind of that area right here. It's on the north run unit, uh, on the north eastern side of Autumn Bay. And this area is just really cool. I don't think Rich knows for sure historically if it was managed for water, but there's structures out there that fell. And a big part of that is due to the Ogden River or Weaver River. Ogden, it's down cut to a point where gravity flow will not feed these areas. And what's out there is a bunch of just natural saltwater plies and even emergent wetlands. But I would say they haven't been functioning for probably close to 20 plus years now. So, go ahead, next slide. The main point for this project is one, to get approval from the Corps to actually build a parking lot for the Willard Spur. And two, it's going to really enhance and increase wildlife habitat at Ogden Bay by successfully meeting these mitigation requirements. Um, go ahead, next slide. These are just a few pictures of the area. You can see just mud flats or salt flats. But the area, I mean, all this could be flooded. It's great potential to have flooded sandy marshes and Emergent marsh, and it's all interconnected just by channels and, and natural areas. There is some like grease wood out here and, and good upland habitat, but the potential is there because there's just some awesome stuff to increase the you know, wildlife usage. Go ahead, next slide. So here's a picture of the river. Uh, this, these pictures don't even do justice. This is probably eight to 10 foot incline from the river level, and that's about as high as we can hold it. So the downstream of our main head gates, any higher than that, we're either going to flood those head gates or else we start flooding out adjacent landowners and communities nearby. This is the original ditch that used to fill these playas, and you can see it's grown in. There's a should be a culvert right here, but it's collapsed and fell. And, uh, yeah, we just can't flood this area of our WMA anymore. Our next slide. This was a like 12 inch culvert pipe that passed through and it interconnected another pipe in the back here. It's completely eroded and collapsed. This one isn't functioning anymore. So there's two, two old structures that need to be replaced. And then we'd like to do a third structure on the southwest corner. Go to the next slide. So the main needs for this project, uh, we're going to need two water control structures. We're going to have to create a berm on the southwest corner of these plies, which I'll show you in a minute on the map. This will kind of allow us to retain water and fill these plies out here. And then the big expense is going to be purchasing a diesel pump. By, do, by purchasing a diesel pump, we should be able to fill these plies. And I imagine it'll have to run for a few days to fill everything, maybe a week. But uh, once it's filled and, and everything's been saturated, I really think it's going to just be periodically, once every two or three weeks, top off apply it, keep them where we want. Um, go ahead, next slide. This kind of plan. This is the river right here. The pump, we just pump short distance into the main playa. And from here, it kind of goes through different fingers and floods the area. This is the burn, like I was saying, that we put out here just to keep this water from spreading out to a different part of the area. We're actually getting water to this part through another canal, but we just don't have the capacity to, to backfill and reach up into this north arm of our WMA. Um, so yeah, we've got to replace the structure here, which keeps the water from going back into the river, and then replace this one, which is already there historically. And if we put that new one in over here, that will allow us you know, to, to manage the water, and we can adjust the level and keep everything saturated as need be. The pump's efficient enough, we could even sheet flow out here on some of this salt flat to create some nice shorter habitat. Uh, 
yeah, it just has a lot of potential. I really like the opportunity we have here. I think it's just a, a win-win situation for wildlife as well as creating an opportunity. You can go to the next slide. So a win-win because one, it's going to satisfy the core, or hopefully it satisfies the core mitigation work that we need to increase the quality you want. Second of all, it would be creating, you know, enhancing 100 acres of wetlands here. And uh, one of the big kickers to that is to increase that parking lot. If we can't get a mitigation site approved, then we're probably going to have to go to a mitigation bank and purchase credits that way. But if you're familiar with mitigation credits and core, typically they may be purchased them at a three to one ratio. So our parking lot being an acre in size, you have to buy three credits worth, which uh, I talked to our engineer. He said that credit right now is going from seventy-five thousand to hundred thousand dollars. So we'd be looking at a two hundred twenty-five to three hundred thousand dollars deal just to purchase credits so we can put in our parking lot expansion. By going with this plan, purchasing the pump and supplies needed, we'll be able to one enhance you know close to hundred acres of wetland up on the Trilber habitat as well as satisfy the mitigation. Uh, next slide. This is kind of the breakdown for the project. Um, main expensive to say is going to be the, the six inch diesel pump and then just the fees to the fuel cost to run it and other supplies needed and hoses and whatnot. 10,000 for water control structures that we need to place on the area. And I thought that Troy, you really like the idea. I know it was all on board with us at W dollars. So. That's in that 350 category. Any questions? I have one. No, go ahead. I, I was just curious, you know, one at one point the, there was infrastructure that delivered water from the Weaver River to this area you're talking about. And and have you explored instead of using a pump, going in and, and basically you know renovating those, those the infrastructure that delivered yeah, and that's something we've looked at first, just to make more sense than instead of having a pump. And we're so flat out there, there's really no nothing we could do to get the water to elevate and come up to these playas. Not um, even at a different location? No. We would have to start you know, miles back up to the different property. Kind of like a canal to feed this area. Okay. One of the big problems too, Drew, is uh, back in 2011 when there was a lot of flooding on the Weaver River. It did downturn. Um, we we were blamed for the flooding that occurred five miles upstream. However, when the engineers surveyed it, we're eight feet lower, so we had nothing to do with it. But what they did is they went in with drag lines and they dug it deep. So still, so essentially they dropped lost the water. elevation. Yeah, we lost elevation. Um, so that that's the biggest reason. And then you know every year we're losing eroding as well, so it's getting wider and it's deeper now. So it would be really difficult to to bring it up and, and we can't go down too far either i mean the engineer said we can't go down because we're just so high where we want to flood that it, it's just not that blows <laughs> the core might not prove this because we're having to pump water but we purpose it and we have it you know year round ready to go at least our engineer says that it's basically you may not know this, but I was just curious about you know that that pump and how much water you'd have to pump and whether you've actually done the math on what it would take to keep that wet. I don't think we've done the math, but we have. We're using a similar pump on the south portion of our area, and I mean we're going to run full tilt or run our uh, shrub rows and irrigate fields and fill similar plies. And just from our experience with it. I really think, you know, once the area is saturated, it, it, I think we just have to run it for a day, you know, every two to three weeks. Okay. To top off there. It's impressive volume of water. Will you just um, add on your map page um, points for your, where the water control, water control structures are going to go? Yes. Thanks. My question, Senator, I, I think it's a, a good project. Um, as far as the mitigation or the trade off for that one acre, do they not look at the rest of the great work we're doing on the WMA? Like, I, that's no. a better question. That's it. It's yeah. really frustrating from our standpoint because we would love to have them out and show them what we're doing and what we want to accomplish. It's 
It's hard to even get a hold of. Okay. Well, I have had them out over the years. I'll take them on airboat rides and just have the whole office come out. They still don't. They don't even see that. You know, uh, an impact to to a half an acre or an acre of wetlands is still an impact, even though we're enhancing three or four hundred. Yeah. And it's it's Whatever. hard. I mean, we've got so many properties that we're doing so many good things. Yeah. And then to say we hope that they approve this water being pumped out, I. I don't know. It's hard to wrap my mind around. It sounds like we need to get into the mitigation bank business. Yeah. And, uh, is that machine like they're talking about the seventy-five to hundred thousand dollars? I think it's yeah. going right. Yeah. Have you checked on um, like water rate issues? Is there going to need to be a, a change application to add that in? We're the last user. Check with Maybe check with Eric, get a chance to clarify it. And... One more question I have. It, I don't know all the properties we have in the state, but it seems like a lot of the ones we do, one of the challenges we face is we don't have enough water. And if you're going to be putting water across 100 acres and potentially sheet flooding that stuff south, I don't know the situation. I mean, do we have plenty of water for this type of endeavor? We would have enough to, to utilize this area and we'll keep like Auburn Bay. Okay. Just you know, some part of the WMA. Keep all our impoundments full of what we do. I mean, we're limited on how much we can distribute out of the lake as well. Justin, I'm, I can answer that too. Yeah. Is we we worked out a deal with Weaver Basin Water and the River Commissioner. Our water rights give us a lot more water than what we want because uh, prior to making these agreements, we we were filling our impoundments. And we were sheet flowing water in the lake. So sheet flowing water in the lake during the growing season. All we were doing was, was growing frag mines. Yeah, right. Thousands of acres. So what we do is we are actually banking some of our water with the commissioner and Weaver Basin during the growing season. Mm -hmm. And then come September 1st or September 15th, whenever we want that water, we call for it. So rather than getting 80 CFS, we're getting 250 CFS where we can really flood things up in time for migration. Okay. Um, prior to that, it was taking until the end of October, even into November, to get the areas flooded outside of the dikes that, that need to be flooded to provide enough habitat for all the waterfowl. So it's a win win. So that's a your question. Yes, we have yeah. plenty of water. Okay. And the Weaver Basin folks are working with you good. They're not pushing back on you. We've got a great so, relationship with them and the great. river commissioner. So it's, it's been a win win situation. That's the way it should work. Good job. I love it. If I think if there's nothing else, I'd make a motion that we tentatively approve this for funding. Okay. A motion. Second. Okay. A motion from Justin. Is Jack, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. No. Okay. Motion carries. All right. Uh, do you know? She's on. Okay. Heather is on. Uh, our next project is 5945. Thanks, Rich. Um, Habitat Forever Specialist Position. Actually, what's the <laughs> I'm, I'm going to present for Heather okay. on this. Um, this is a, a position that uh, I was talking to Charlie Holt and to Heather, and we were just trying to think outside the box on how we can get more help to do more good for the uplands at not only Ogden Bay, but also Salt Creek public shooting grounds, even some of the walk-in access areas. I mean, I think one of the, one of the misconceptions is you know, Ogden Bay Waterfowl Management Area is listed here a couple times, and that they would be supervised out of Ogden Bay. So this position would would be, you know, this would be year one of a three year project trying to increase the amount of quality upland habitat in the northern region. Um, this assists this would this would be a person on the ground coming up with their own ideas and, and own projects on Ogden Bay, Salt Creek, and public shooting grounds. We would be there to assist them. We already have the equipment, a lot of the personnel, and we know how to get the volunteers there. So I, I just, what Col, Colton and I manage 55,000 acres, or the only two charge of that. Chad and Arlo oh, manage what, yeah, 30, 40,000, and then we each have two technicians. So we're just limited what we can do. So we're just thinking outside the box on how we can get another person to really make a difference out there and really expand what we're doing. And 
when we started looking at it, if we could get this position, we think we could double the acreage and food plots that we currently do on every area and double the fall plantings that we do, the, the perennial grasses and forbs that we put out. And also, this person would think of great projects to, to put in trees and shrubs and, and facilitate those projects. So, um, and all of that would just occur April to April through October. So, and you've got November through the first of April, where this position would fill the the position of the quail trapping person that we're already paying for, right? So that will take care of that. And then they would also play a vital ro role in turkey trapping and relocation. So it would be a very diverse position where, you know, they do these things, they can help us with water management or banding or, or something like that. But their priority is going to be um, upland projects. And, and they're going to have a lot of freedom to, to help out a lot of people. One thing that Heather and I were talking about as well was, you know, March would be a great time for them to take on a lot of sage grouse counts and uh, maybe facilitate that. And I did do a sage grouse project too. So, um, Heather, do you want to add anything? I think you pretty well covered it. Thanks so much, Rich, for presenting that project. Yeah, I just feel like it also will, you know, since we are paying for those turkey trapper positions and that quail trapper position, like you pointed out, that will save us half an FTE because this position will be supervised by Pheasants Forever. It is one of those Pheasants Forever Habitat specialist positions. So we will have um, work with SFW and, and Pheasants Forever in the hiring and everything and then Pheasants Forever will do, will actually employ that individual. And sorry about the background noise today, guys. I'm out on an appointment. So anyway, just wanted to throw that in there. All right. Hi, this is Charlie Holt. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Certainly. So my name's Charlie Holt. I work with Pheasants Forever out of Vernal, Utah. I uh, used to be a partner position uh, with the uh, NRCS and then since moved to uh, their national seed program. But I was a habitat specialist um, in Montana, and it was a partnership between um, their Fish, Wildlife and Park state agency and then also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and there's thousands of acres, um, new acres that were established on these waterfowl production areas and the wildlife management area. And then also um, my base camp was at the uh, National Bison Range that the Fish and Wildlife Service hosted and owned. Um, and there were a lot of other projects like sharp tail reintroduction, um, bighorn sheep transplanting and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity um, with these positions. Um, and I just wanted to make that statement and um, if there's a way, I have a couple pictures. If there's a way that I can share my screen, Daniel. Go ahead, Charlie. All right. Let's see. Are you able to see the slideshow? Yes. Yep. Very good. So, yeah, this is just a sample of what was done in my position in Montana that I hold dear to my heart, uh, north of Missoula, south of uh, Kalispell, right there in the Mission Valley. Um, like I said, a number of partners, including the Pheasants Forever chapters um, in that region, just like uh, this scenario where we have the Logan and Salt Lake chapter contributing to this. Um, we targeted um, uh, basically ground nesting birds. And so that was the main target of um, targeting weedy areas and selecting those to turn into a perennial habitat structure, which, you know, the first few seasons um, of the herbicide would be uh, turned into a food plot. So you're spraying those broadleaf weeds 
um, with a grain food plot work pretty well. Um, a lot of noxious weed control, um, utilizing equipment, um, collecting uh, bugs, uh, beetles for knapweed, distributing those, utilizing prescribed grazing uh, for these projects, along with um, prescribed fire. Um, these positions, you know, more or less are expected to be trained and utilize the services that their partners have, um, get a CDL license, move equipment around. Um, those winter months, you know, we're talking seed drill maintenance, other maintenance. Um, in between times of planting, I was involved in monitoring vegetation uh, for sharp tailed grouse reintroduction. In the area, we also had ground nesting uh, shorter owls, so taking points when we would find those nests. Uh, water manipulation, obviously, um, at the bison range, there were some bighorn sheep that needed testing, we did some necropsies, and then also reintroductions along with swans. Uh, at the bison range too, was involved in their bison roundup. And, you know, that was Hungarian partridge habitat, got to work on sharp tail habitat, pheasant, um, waterfowl, short ear owls, and it all resulted in more habitat, birds and dogs mouths and hunters hands. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thanks, Charlie. Thanks. Anything else, Rich? Yeah, do we want to go through the breakdown of the budget? Yeah, really quick. Okay, so the uh, personal services would, you know, be paid for. Let's see, PR PR dollars would be used for this, for it's on WMAs and whatnot. So, um, personal services, staff expenses, contract management would all go through uh, WRI. Um, Pheasants Forever and Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife would could each contribute an equal amount of $7,427. So, great partnership with, with everyone come together. We would ask uh, $5,000 from Habitat Council as well. And then, and yeah, the funding, the funding breakdown would be the $7,400 each for Pheasants Forever SFW. PR dollars in the 5,000 habitat council. All right, any other questions? Anyway, comment, <clears throat> and then maybe just a couple thoughts. And we have one of these positions that we share with Trout Unlimited, and I think these types of positions are incredibly valuable to us as an agency. And I think this will be as well. And so I just wanted to say that, okay. but there's a couple thoughts. I just want to make sure that you guys are thinking about this is, is one, to tie this into a contract that isn't in perpetuity. You know, your priorities and where you need work done and what that work is, is going to change through time. And I would be, you know, really uh, create the, the contract for a length of time that you see needed here. And then allow the, this position or any positions like this to be flexible and adapt to not just your priorities, but, you know, the, the entire section's priorities. And then, and two, uh, since you're share costing this, uh, make sure that their work, or at least your part of their work that you're paying for, is in your work plan. And that part of this person goes through the work planning process so they're accountable, not just to Pheasants Forever, but to us as well, for the half that we're buying. And I think you're going to be completely happy and satisfied. So those are just a couple thoughts. Thank you, he, you know, I wanted to throw in real quick, too. I think this is probably a, I'm new to this, but it looks like this is a pretty non-typical type proposal. But a couple things. I'm excited about it because there's almost no upland projects out there. And Eric, you know, you referred to it earlier that there's dibs and drafts here and there. But this is something that's actually focusing on upland, which makes me excited. And to go along with that, I think there's a ton of potential with a lot of, for lack of a better term, low-lying fruit. I mean, we've got this new land in the Salt Creek area and different things that need to be developed uh, for upland. So we, we can start expanding those little islands I was referencing earlier when we are talking about Ogden Bay. Birds can't survive on these little islands. We've got to get as much land in actual production for upland as possible. So... I, I, I'm uh, I'm excited about this project. It has potential as long as it's properly guided, like it was just pointed out. 
And then I'm just going to throw in again why I'm on a tirade and I apologize again that I'm not there. But anything we can do to get valuable, good upland projects. I'm, I'll admit, I'm very disappointed in how few upland projects we have. And this is one of the handful that we have today that I'm very excited about. Thank you for those comments and also the comment on the funding cycle. Um, for example, in Montana, it started with a three-year situation that moved to five years, and then now it's still going in 2022. So it, it grew, and you know it's in perpetuity uh, just with how it went. So just for example, it did start with just a three-year, which I think this one is. Um, and and um, like the other gentleman commented, you know, this is an unplanned game bird, waterfowl, upland nesting, ground nesting bird deal with big game as the side benefit versus the opposite um, that we argue that big game, you know, projects are a byproduct of what can happen with the upland. So it's unique. Thank you. I've got one comment for Allison that I'm ready to make a motion on this at the end when we're wrapping everything up at our last meeting, if we're short on upland money and pretty flush on PR, we have the ability to not fund this with Habitat Council because the match is there with the expo and the, the, the pheasants forever. So if we can just keep a note of that, I, I think, okay. as, as we put it all together. But Yeah, when I talked to Heather yesterday, um, on her enhancement, the enhancement was for 39000 so that's yep. why she put the extra 5000 Yeah, just Council, just if we get in the jam that way, so or if, if we're looking at it and we have more ups on that we want to fund. So. But with that, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion. I think we should approve this. I love the project and uh, I recommend, I, I make the motion that we approve it for funding consideration. All right, I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion from Justin. We have a second from Randy. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. All right, motion carries. Okay, we are past the break Thank time. You. Well done, and uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break till 11 o'clock. And we'll start up again at 11.
back. Okay, right. thank you. All right, we're back on from our break and we're gonna resume. We have project number 5976, Umpland Habitat Enhancement, Edge Management, Technician Salt Creek, Public Shooting Grounds. You're up. Remember to introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Arlo Wing. I'm the assistant manager at Salt Creek uh, Public Shooting Grounds WMAs. Yes. This, uh, this proposal, I actually have a uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's similar to Farmington Bay and Auburn Bay. It's that we, we combined our upland enhancement uh, request with our technician request. Um, so our technicians really are the backbone of those projects. These wells. These old vertical wells produce so much oil, um, but there's gaps in them. Logs on. Um, <laughs> okay, go ahead. go ahead and jump to the next slide. So, part of, a lot of what we do with the shrub row planting on on Salt Creek, we have uh, six different uh, shrub row areas that have been planted over the over the years. The oldest probably about uh, mid '90s that we're still maintaining. Um, up to the last couple of years, where we're planting anywhere between two to five hundred uh, old potted uh, potted shrubs. Um, and then we're planting golden current wood rose, buffalo berries, Siberian pea shrub, uh, eastern red cedar. These are kind of the plants that we found that, that actually will grow there at Salt Creek. Um, as the name implies, salt. Uh, we don't get a lot of good vegetation and when stuff does finally take off, it hits a certain stage and will typically die. We don't know if it's a salt layer in, in, the, in the ground somewhere or, or what's going on. And so it's a continual project. We'll move to the next slide. Uh, with our projects, we also do a number of uh, upland food plot plantings. These are uh, winter wheat plant in the fall. Um, we'll typically prepare anywhere from 20 to 30 acres, kind of scattered through the 2,000 plus acres of upland on, on Salt Creek. And uh, we'll kind of rotate these through the different areas. Um, we've seen everything from sandhill cranes using them in the, in the spring, just so the seed heads ripen, geese grazing on it, to pheasants and, and other birds. Use it quite heavily. Um, we'll do a mix of either the seed drill or the broadcast, uh, broadcast planting and harrowing it. So, next slide. One thing that we've been playing with over the last few years is uh, planting golden and Japanese millet in some of our ponds. We'll dry them up. These are ponds that aren't super productive as far as. Uh, Aquatic vegetation goes for, for waterfowl. So we'll dry them out. Um, we started off by disking uh, these areas. You can kind of see it in that picture right there. Uh, and then plant it, fertilize it, and, and then start irrigating it. We, we've kind of found that in the areas that we don't disk, the seed gets into the, the cracked mud. Um, it actually does extremely well. So we cut out the step of, of disking. Uh, those dry pond beds. Um, and we'll set out oh, about a quarter mile of pan line uh, and then irrigate it through the summer. And then it's kind of what you end up with at the end of the, the summer. And we'll, towards, towards the end of the growing season, uh, well, just before the, uh, the waterfowl hunt start, we'll actually see a lot of pheasant use in these, uh, in these areas. And then, uh, just before the waterfowl hunt, we'll pull the hand line out and flood the area. And basically, the, the waterfowl usage is, is through the roof in this area. They'll, they'll go in and strip this, this, this out and probably, what, Chad, a couple of weeks, two, three weeks. So the birds will use it really heavily. We'll go ahead and next. With that millet planting, we also have what we call our wheel line uh, field. This is about so four or five acres. Yeah, close to five. Um, we'll plant a mix of millet and sorghum in there, irrigate it through the summer, 
Um, of course, this I prep the field each year. It's uh, uh, isking, soil amendments, fertilizer, that kind of thing, and then seeding it, and of course, irrigating it. And that's we rely on our technicians to do that. So um, in addition to those plantings, we also will plant anywhere from 40 to upwards of 130, 140 acres of uh, perennial areas, uh, areas that have just kind of gone uh, stagnant. They're not really productive. There's a lot of weeds. Um, in the past, we just disc it, seed it, let it go, hope for the best. Talking with uh, GBRC, um, we've kind of changed the way we do things. Now what we'll do is go in in the fall uh, or even in the summer if we have time, disc the area, then we'll, uh, in the fall, we'll apply plateau, uh, herbicide uh, uh, pre-emergent, and let it lay fallow for, for basically a year. Um, try and kill all those any more of the weeds that we're having issues with, the grassy weeds. Uh, then the next fall, it, we'll take a look at it. If it needs retreatment with glyphosate or some other herbicide, we'll do that. And then we'll seed after that. Seed harrow and then, and then uh, see what comes up in the spring. So next slide. Um, and our, our, and Chad will touch on this a little bit later, but uh, our technicians, we use them heavily through the frag project. Um, we really wouldn't be able to cover as much ground without them. Next. So, of course, our duties include uh, you know, water management, helping us you know, pull and add boards as needed, uh, goose and duck banding, fence construction, maintenance, uh, just basically whatever comes up, predator trapping. As much as we can get them out there doing that, we do. Next. So, as a reminder, we picked up the, uh, the Jensen property that combined Salt Creek on the north here to, to uh, public shooting grounds in the south. Uh, we took ownership just prior to the waterfowl season starting this last fall, in early summer. Um, some of the money that we're asking for in this proposal is to help us finish signing a lot of that area as well as add or not add, but replace or repair some existing fence lines that are there. Um, we used some of our regular operational funds to put signs up just to get us through this waterfowl season. It's barely enough, so we want to add some more signs so people know where it's at and where they can and can't go. Go ahead. Um, and actually, it works up to the database for this page. So we're asking for $64,000, which is about $6,000 less than last year. Um, the breakdown at $5,000 for a technician vehicle, uh, $16,000 so $16, for materials, supplies, the trees and shrubs, $3,500. About a thousand dollars for seed that's not coming from GBRC. That's our winter wheat, our millet, sorghum, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, just going down. Uh, contractual services. We've actually been using the Bear River Co-op in that area to come out and do a lot of our uh, spraying on the large tracts of land that we're disking up. Um, there, as well as seeding or spreading the soil amendments. They can do it in about two or three hours where it takes us about four or five days at a cost of about 10 to $12 per acre for that. So, um, and technician, same as the others, 29,000 professional services, uniform supplies, that kind of thing. Um, Asking $16,000 from Habitat Council with a $48,000 ER match. Any questions? Or? Are these huntable pieces of property? I mean, are they rest areas? No, they're they're huntable. Okay. Up, just, 
not a water power guy, so I just wanted to. We do have our rest areas on the WMAs for waterfowl hunting, yeah, but our upland areas are almost all huntable. I move that we approve the project. Second. Okay. We have a motion from Jack and a second from Tyler. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. All right, motion carries. Okay. Harold Crane Center, like your bear. Last few years we have a we actually have a grazer on top of that one. Yeah, so this project's gonna be on Harold Crane, it's a center dive repair. Uh there's through the map, so you can kind of see all the Harold Crane. The main area we're going to be talking about is this black line. So you can see how big Harold Crane is. I just wanted to give some background on it before I really start getting into the project. Next slide. So Harold Crane was developed in 1966 as a mitigation property when the Florida Bay was established. Uh, Sam Manis was the last manager of Harold Crane. He managed Harold Crane itself as well as the River Upland Game Area, which is comprised of about 11,500 acres. He retired in 2004, and once he retired, the division kind of dissolved his position, and Ogden Bay managers kind of took over management of, of that facility. So, uh, really, since 2004, Harold Crane has been on like a downward spiral. Just lost a lot of capability of farm management. Um, most of this just lack of personnel and time and power to get up there. Some of that's to do with the budget. I don't believe any budget was inherited by Alden Bay once management was dissolved up the Harold Crane. And so it's kind of become the, the problem child of the northern region, WMAs. I mean, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done. And it's getting to a point where it's all going to be pretty big projects and expensive projects. Uh, so expect more projects through the coming years of that. Uh, next slide. Dive into the project itself. This is Center Dike at Harold Crane. It separates the east and west pond, as you can see. So you can see how open this portion. This is about a half mile section of relatively open water. And like Jason presented earlier, this portion of dike is just always under constant wind and wave erosion, as well as ice damage. And it's got to a point where you just really need to do the pit situation. Next slide. Here you can see the dike and just how steep the edges are and how much we've lost, how narrow it is. You know, in this spot, it's almost not even drivable. It actually is only drivable during the winter months when it's frozen. Uh, the rest of the year, there's enough rat holes and just, you know, submerged water still going through the dike where we try driving across it from the truck and sink the truck. So only access is by throw over. Next slide. There's a few more pictures of the dike and how bad the erosion is on it. Um, that's some good pictures showing how poor stay it's in. There's a culvert on the north end of center dike. This culvert, you can see far bottom of that, completely rusted through. It's no really, it's not really functioning anymore. We're not able to utilize it to manage the water. Water does flow through it from the east to west pond. But we can't put boards in there and use it for management purposes. Next slide. So our biggest concern with center dike is if it breaches. If we lose center dike, one, it's going to just cause a water management nightmare. That water kind of naturally bounds to the northwest corner. So it'll flow more or less from the east corner to the west. Likely. And once it does that, our outer perimeter dike is in bad shape as well. So then we're you know, could potentially lose our western dike and lose east and west point altogether with water management. Uh, with water management comes Phragmites. If we lose control of managing the water, then Phragmites and cattail are sure to explode and take over much of these units. What's our biggest concern? Why do we need to prepare? Next slide. So our plan for this project is to originally go in and build up and widen the, the dike to its original toe. Um, 
which will allow us to access the back again, as well as create longer lasting infrastructure. Uh, we need to replace the water control structure on the north end. And then this thing, to keep it from eroding further, we want to go in and try grubbing the edges of the dike. We did this on the south dike of Harold Crane, it was pretty good success. What we've done is kind of raise about a 10 yard portion off the dike, and then we put in grubbings, organic material, kind of dissed it more or less, and it really allows that natural vegetation to come back and establish a lot faster. And it helps impede the erosion from continuing to occur. There are several spots where the erosion is horrible, and just to help that process go smoother and you know, make sure it stays intact. <laughs> Next slide. So, here's the equipment we're going to need. Uh, the plan would kind of be to drain the east and west pond in early May. That should allow by August. Everything to dry out and get in there and try to get that the project actually started on the ground. Uh, the plan would be with the dried out units to use material from the units to actually build the dike back up. Put the organic matter of grub on the edges. And we want to go with a three point slope, which should really help last for a long time, make it more pleasant for hunters and stuff like that. Put some great sit there, drop offs. Uh, next slide. Like I said, this top left picture that's kind of the grubbing along the dock that we would do, which really promotes the vegetation regrowth. I wish I had a picture of that same dock. It's now four foot tall and cattail and some bulrush and stuff that really keeps the road from occurring. These are wetland saw mats. We want to do that along the majority of that same dock we want to replace or repair. Next slide. Uh, we need a culvert in the north end. This helps water management. Um, by doing that, you know, we can keep water open longer and just help fluctuate our water levels through the time that we manage appropriately. Needed. Next slide. So, again, this is kind of a map. Uh, really, it's just this portion of open water that we need to repair. It's about a half mile section of dike. Um, this map shows the dike and then kind of the grubbing. We would do in several spots. You can see we have cattail and sea fried mines, which are already helping the dike stay intact and keep from eroding from the wave and, and uh, ice action. So we don't have to hit a few points. Next slide. This is kind of budget for it for proposed. It's a fairly expensive project, but talk with Troy Map at West W, and they really want to get there. Put on the door and some bigger, you know, uh, WMA projects, and maybe also for the So help me understand the decision to try to do the sod map instead of the cobble on this. It's definitely an option to do the cobble, which is being even more expensive than the sod maps. And the big thing with running the sod maps on this side. It's one of our most utilized areas for water hunters. If you're putting in saw mats, it's going to provide some time to hide and actually hunt better versus try to conceal yourself on a cobble dive. Would provide nesting cover as well for. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I had a question, but just an observation. It seems like a lot of these projects in the north have been funded with SFW Expo dollars, whereas I think in the past a lot of this would have been Habitat Council dollars. And I'm appreciative of, of Troy and Matt and others that are making this an emphasis and a focus for them. So I think it's great. Yeah, they've been above and beyond lately, helping us get equipped in just all the different projects they've been on. I agree. There's no other comments. I'll make a motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion from Justin and a second from Steve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. Okay. T89, Pragmatics Management for Improving Bear River Delta and Associated Wetlands. Who's up for this one? 
Fish and Wildlife Service. Jen, Jennifer Wright. Yeah, she's a pleasure, man. She got one. <laughs> How familiar are you with it? Uh, so far, no, we don't. I'll probably say a few things about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're being recorded at that house. So. <laughs> yeah, so really, this is a project I think they're looking to do hire out some contractors for some bread, ground treatment, Pragmites. Um, over the past five or six years, we've been cooperating with them and getting some aerial treatments done on their property, but they've lacked the on the ground follow-up treatments uh, that's really needed to, to knock this plant back. And I think you'll see in the next presentation of really what can happen if you can uh, get some aerial treatments, ground treatments and stay on top of this. Ground spraying contract, uh, they also do some grazing out there. They've kind of came and looked at a lot of grazing that we do on some of our other WMAs and have been doing some grazing to, to help knock it back as well on their areas now the past three, four years, I think. Uh, really, that's all I know about this project. <laughs> um, how much they ask for? They'll ask them for 50 grand. Um, hire contractors, marsh masters to do spraying. And then 9,500, it looks like they're going to supply for the herbicide cost. I don't know if there's much more I can say about it. But in the hospital area? I do not know where they map this project out. Is the, the, the per acre and dollar number here similar to what it would be on a WMA? Yeah. Yeah, the contracting for it is going to be very similar to what us forestry fire and state land is seeing. I think it's like 75 to 95 bucks an acre. Of course, over the past year, that, that may have gone up a little bit. Did she click on having that council or did you guys click on what I'm on She clicked, she had clicked Habitat Council. I just split it 50 50 between Habitat Council and WR. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if she really knew the, the difference. Oh, anyway, I will say, is you know, kind of being the frag guy, this is a pretty important part of their what they're trying to do and stuff. And I'd like to see them trying to get something done with this ground. Okay, we, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, is this, maybe maybe we don't have an answer, but is, it seems like this would be a PR eligible project as well. Can we not use PR because we're getting, or, or US Fish and Wildlife Service map? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, they're putting up 9,500 fish and wildlife money. I, I don't see why we couldn't break some of that other money out to PR. Yeah, it right? seems like you could, unless Tyler on the WRI side, I mean, it just ranking up. It didn't. It came through pretty low rank. Her first time through the process, she's yeah. got a lot to learn. And that's something you can help her with, honestly. You guys always score well through WRI. And, yeah. And actually, this I didn't know this project was in until a couple of days before presentation. So I was kind of like, Mm. I know we she talked about this and maybe just yeah. put it together. And that's what we tell her when she says, well, why didn't I score very well? Yeah, we'll talk to the folks that have been scoring well and get some help from them. So why well, yeah. that push to next year <clears throat> or? Why well, I guess it, it educate me. It, it, I mean, we do other Phragmites control projects. Why would this not score well and not score better? Just because she didn't put the right information in the proposal. Okay. How important is this to them if they didn't show up to actually present their own project? I think that's part of the first, you know, their first go around through this process is I don't think they knew that they were, they already went through the WRI <laughs> proposal. They probably didn't know there was no one. I 
You know, it, it seems like sometimes um, the refuge takes some heat for not, you know, getting on top of certain issues to the same degree that the WMA has been successful in doing. I hate to see them now that they're trying to do some of that get mm -hmm. immediately slapped down, mm -hmm. get some work. I just, right. you're, honestly, if, you have, if you're the person up there and you haven't heard about this until yesterday or the day before, I, I it's maybe a motion, but I just want to talk this through. Like, I, I really am supportive of these kind of things, but there needs to be some collaboration and cooperation between agencies to make sure that, you know, this project isn't part of something bigger or there's not some way that we can help them improve it. Yeah, I would love to see you guys working with the Bear River and with Forestry Fire and State Lands and have one each comprehensive track Maddie's plan for that air. It's honestly what I hope for for you guys. I know you guys work pretty well with Forestry Fire now. Yeah, we do. We've had a lot of partners over the years, and I'll kind of go over that in the next presentation, but um, there's still some work and cooperation that we have. And to me, this is kind of the indication that they're now might be a person there that's willing to start working on fragmenting and, and that's something we should take advantage of yeah you are currently fairly spraying us yeah so this we've been the i mean work, yeah this is just the groundwork yeah uh we've been yeah spraying on the refuge through our project for six seven years now um and anyway, I was, I, oh, sorry, Alice. I was just going to add to Jennifer's credit, she was not invited to meet. So, so that's our failure, right? Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe I'll make a motion. Then I, I would make a motion that we table it and push it to a, a later meeting, and make sure that Jennifer gets contacted. I'd second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion about that? Okay. I, um, I've got one thing. I, I like that idea because I've got some questions as well for the strategies. I mean, it's a lot of money, and a lot of this involves cattle grazing, which sometimes you can make money from. So I'm, I, I don't understand all the details of of this, and so I would love to hear from her. So I'm in favor. Okay, we have a motion from Tyler, a second from Jack to table this project. And all in favor, say aye. 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 There any opposed say no okay motion is tabled um for now maybe can work with her to retool this one and bring it back i agree with jack the air that area needs some work from what i've seen and okay i love that she brought something forward though i think that's awesome yeah me too i think it's a great start but you want the conversations to take place <clears throat> um, if that was our fault that we didn't get her here to present this, then I'm going to apologize for that. And, uh, yeah, she spent like a week spraying with us too, so I just like a yeah, man, they actually put they're getting a little more involved, involved with what they're trying to do. They That's come cool. out and, and help us during our ground treatments and whatnot. So it is good. I I think the the fallback was they just put in this project, and it was like, oh, well, we kind of meshed our projects together, we could have done the same thing here and, and whatnot. So I think you in the could future, have meshed in with your project? Yes. And it would have sailed through. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. Okay. Next one, 5927, Frag is an invasive weed control. Yeah, so this is a project that's uh been going on for a long time. Most of you have probably heard a lot about it. <laughs> um it's been going on since 2006. Since that time, we've treated about 50,000 plus acres. That's not uh, virgin acres, that's actually a cumulative acreage through this three to four year treatment cycle where we treat the same acreage for that many years. It also includes the maintenance acreage after that treatment cycle, and then a couple of areas that the original treatment has failed. Um, but still, that's, that's a lot of acreage. Um, as I said, this has been going on for so long, most of you are probably pretty familiar with it, so I don't want to get into the details of actual project implementation. I really want to just show off the progress we've been able to make. I know all the waterfowl guys are really happy and proud of what we're seeing, so I want you guys to see that as well. Uh, first, let's just take a look at the next slide, Daniel, and we'll 
just show you what we're trying to do here. We are bringing forestry fire state lands onto this project. Uh, we did last year. Uh, we were able to fund a little bit to them last year. But anyway, DWR, we're looking at treating over 3,000 acres from the air, covering and treating over 3,000 acres from the ground, mowing about 700, and then grazing over 5,000 5, acres between all the WMAs. Forestry Fire State Lands is hoping to spray about 8,000 acres from the air, uh, mow and trample 5,000 acres, seed around 100, and then graze over 2,000. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, aerial spray about 1,800, 1,900 acres, which is what we've been doing for the past five, six years. And then Cache and Box Elder counties have also been on this project for about five, six years now. They each uh, spray about two to 300 acres a year. So moving on to some of these photo monitoring points we've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, I got quite a few of these, but a lot of them are cool. Uh, start off in the top left there in 2017. This is the East Crystal unit at Farmington Bay. You can see a little bit of frag mixed in, but in the background there, you see these big patches and whatnot. Uh, by 2020, there's very little frag in the foreground. In the background, you can still see a, a yellow patch of sprayed Phragmites there. But by 2021, it's mostly cattail. Uh, you can still see some dead remnant frag there from past springs and whatnot. Looks, looks pretty different. Next slide. Uh, this is a different photo monitoring point on the same unit. Um, 2017, we just had this wall of frag here. By 2021, there's no frag left in that picture. Uh, you can actually see the pond. Um, most of this vegetation is cattail. There's some bulrushes mixed in there, but mostly cattail. Next. Same story, Hill Crane. We had this huge monoculture of frag. In 2018, after spraying, mowing, spraying a couple more years, um, 2021, this is what it looks like now. Um, we are using, this is an area where we are using cows to maintain that area now. So it went through that three-year herbicide mowing treatment, put cows on it to maintain the frag that's still there coming back. Looks great. Um, you can see actually see some bulrush popping in here and there on the edge of the ponds and out in the middle. In the background, you can see where the private property is and where the frag is still going crazy. <laughs> Next slide. Um, same unit at Crane, just a different photo point. Same story. I mean, really, these areas are open enough for making them more accessible to all the wildlife, hunter access, recreation, and whatnot. Next one. This is a photo point at Ogden Bay on the South Bachman unit. In 2017, this was taken, so after the first aerial treatment, and then a couple months after we went in, well, contracted out the trampling of the dead stand. So you can see all that dead litter laying there. You can see some frag popping up in between. We go back in and spray that. By year two, you know, these frag kind of resurges, and that's typically what we see throughout all these areas. The second year, we kind of see the frag bounce back. We'll get back in there and spray it again. Next slide. By year three or four, this is what a lot of these areas are starting to look like. Um, there's very little to no frag in this, off in the distance. Uh, that's probably actually over into another unit or something. But right here in this picture, you've got cattail open water. Start to see submerged aquatic vegetation growing in that open water. Uh, bird use, it's just insane. So. Next one. Same thing with Farm Bay. This is the Till Lake um, area. Back in 2017, there's this huge monoculture frag. Now we've got this big wide open pond. You can see a couple of old remnant dead frag stocks there. Next slide. This is what it looked like this past fall in 2021. Um, they did have this unit dry because they were doing some construction there, but very little frag, if any. Um, I couldn't find any myself, but most of this vegetation you see here is some annual weeds, kinopodes, um, bulrushes, all which are beneficial plants. Next. This is some of the work the Forestry Fire and State Lands has been doing outside of our dikes on our WMA. So this is at uh, Howard Slough. The picture in 2016 was taken just after, probably a couple months after they first aerially sprayed that area, all that yellowish gray stuff is just dead frag as far as you can see really 
Um, by 2019, a lot of that's gone. This low-lying uh, vegetation is mostly saltgrass and foxtail, and then you got some salicornia on these mud flats. You know, that stayed stuck around from the treatments. Next one. Same thing. This one just actually blows my mind. I'm sure it does Ridge too. Anybody that's worked at Farmington Bay. Um, 2017, this is looking outside the Turpin Dyke at Farmington, and it was a complete monoculture frag. Probably, I don't know, 1,800, 2,000 acres out, was out there, and it was probably 90% Phragmites. Um, this is what it looked like this past fall. And this is just kind of goes to show what can happen when these treatments are continued. Um, you get the right conditions and you follow up with the plant. Um, completely different area. Next. Another way to look at this, I thought it was kind of interesting, is just looking at some Google Earth imagery. You can see uh, these big, huge, dark green spots outside the dike here and over by the Till Lake area. That's all frag. Button. And this is the most recent imagery. You can see most of that is gone. Uh, we've got this huge open water pond over here now where there was just nothing but a frag monoculture. Next. Another interesting way, and what I thought was pretty cool, to look at see how different our treatment coverage is compared to when we first started. So on the left there is treatments from the first two years, 06 and 07. You can see it was, you know, three, four areas there. This is what we covered last year at Auburn Bay. I mean, we're really getting out, spreading throughout the whole marsh and getting to hit a lot of the areas. That's same thing in Farmington Bay. It started out with just two or three or four treatments per year. Now we're getting around hitting pretty much every unit in one way or another. Um, so that's really about it as far as the funding goes. Forestry Fire State Lands looking to kick in three hundred forty thousand. Uh, we've got the Central Davis Sewer District uh, just came into this project this year. They'd like to, like to kick in fifty thousand. Cash and Box Elder County do some in kind admin um, trade with us. So about six thousand there. Volunteers we use volunteers heavily during our spraying project, which lasts four to five weeks. Um, so about $6,000 in-kind service there. Fish and Wildlife Service sprays for their aerial treatments. And then we are asking for a substantial amount of federal aid this year. Um, but we've got big plans. <laughs> so uh, we're not asking for Habitat Council money. You know, we just wanted to show this project, kind of highlight it. We have asked for Habitat Council money to pass with this. Um, we just want to show it off a little. Any questions about it? Are you confident with all those uh, funding sources? Yeah. So my my comment, I guess, your question is, I'm sh I'm sure you've heard of the forty million dollars that Speaker Wilson's putting out for Great Salt Lake. Yes. And besides that, Sovereign Lands is changing their funding structure so that they have like an extra eight million dollars a year for Sovereign. What what would you guys do, or how much more would you do, or, or maybe you're at capacity now if you were basically given a blank checkbook? Yeah, I've already been asked this a number of times. <laughs> um, so as far as what what the division employees are doing, the wetland guys, we're maxed out. We really can't do any more work ourselves. Um, however, we can contract more work out. Right now. I don't know if it's a problem, but right now there's basically one contractor that's doing this kind of work. Um, now if there's more funding, uh, bigger contracts, that's probably gonna incentivize some other contractors to come on board. So really, if, as far as DWR personnel and our areas go, if we wanted to expand, we're looking to contract that work out. Forestry Fire State Lands already contracts all of their work out because they don't have equipment personnel. So they contract everything out. Um, but yeah, like I say, I think it's just a matter of let the market show if there's going to be some other interested contractors to get on board. Because right now, the one contractor that's out there is fairly maxed out themselves. Okay. So I think um, just to kind of pick up on what was asked, um, 
how much how much acreage out there is still untreated? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, back this was a while ago, but the the most comprehensive mapping of Phragmites was done back in 2011 through USU, um, and they estimated there was about 27,000 acres of Phrag then. Now that was an extremely wet year, and we know following that growing season. We had a lot of expansion. The reduction in lake level is also exposing more mud flat, allowing Phragmites to continue out. So I don't think anybody knows what that number is. Um, we've definitely been reducing Phragmites in the areas that we're treating, but it's been growing, I don't know, exponentially. It's been growing a lot in the areas we are not treating. There's been studies done back on the East Coast and whatnot that have actually shown, you know, we started out with 1,200 acres of frag. We started treating these two, 300 acres. And that two, 300 acres, it's down to 10% or less. But the rest of it's going, it's going so much, we actually have more than we start out. So if you had, if you had a, you know, a big pot of money through the use of contractors, you could scale up and... Through contractors, we could scale up. Yes. If additional contractors. If additional contractors come on board. Yes. What, what type of contractors is it that, that you're short on? Is it the ground or aerial? The ground. There's there's definitely other aerial contractors out there that we can pick up. Um, <laughs> it's the ground spraying and the mowing and rolling. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> but there's stuff we could do. I mean, there's, you know, Keith and I, Keith is, Forestry, fire, state lands, and basic weed guy. We talk a lot, coordinate all this stuff. And, you know, one of the things, the reason why we decided to bring them on board and start trying to spray some more acreage, especially out of air, is one, that's pretty cheap. But two, we've got, so now we've got a lot of these blocks of really great looking habitat. We've reduced the amount of frag in these areas quite a bit. Well, a mile to two miles away, we've got an 800 patch, 800 acre patch of frag mines there with a huge seed source that could just come right back into that area we treated. So we've kind of talked about doing this um, uh, containment spraying, we're calling it, just going out and spraying this these huge frag patches that are close to the ones we've, areas we've already treated, just to knock back that seed source. Maybe we're not going to go in there and do all the mowing and rolling and whatnot, but we're at least going to hit it with some herbicide, kill it back, and try and get rid of that seed influx into these areas that are looking better now. So that's something moving forward we could actually look at doing as well. Um, you guys are doing an awesome job. Yeah. But your after talk was pretty depressing. <laughs> <laughs> well it's it that's that's another thing that uh, Keith and I are working on is some drone mapping. That's actually part of this project. Um, <clears throat> to try and, and map what's out there again, because nobody really knows. We let Jennifer know that it was nothing personal. It was just, we had more questions and stuff. Cause yeah. it sounds like you need every hand in this battle that you get. Yeah, definitely. And that's why it's been so great to see. I mean, you know, I brought on cash in Box Elder counties years ago. Um, of course, they're just helping reduce the, reduce the seats worse of over W Mays. Uh, I'd like to see some of the other counties get on board as well. Um, you know, and part of, part of why they haven't, I'll be honest, is, uh, this project's getting pretty dang big, even for just me to handle. <laughs> um, it, it sucks a lot of time and stuff away from my other duties. So, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's pretty important. It's probably one of our most important projects in our minds, especially with what we're seeing over the years. Maybe it's time to make chat with the plan coordinator. There needs to be a frag star. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion on this. I'll make the motion. Okay. Second the motion. We have a motion from Tyler to approve and a second from Jack. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. All Thank right. You. Thanks, Chad. So we're at eleven forty seven. I think we can push through two more projects for noon. Lunch is ready for us. So, um, more than nice.
So we folks prepped and ready to go. You see you. Yeah. So okay, we're gonna go ahead. Uh project sixty sixty two desert lake seasonal twenty twenty three. Go ahead. Hi everyone. I'm Joseph Christensen. I'm the waterfowl manager at the Desert Lake Waterfowl Management Area. I also manage the uh, Huntington Wildlife Management Area. Um, and this project is for a seasonal employee for six months of the year to help with all of the maintenance and uh, habitat work that happens on the WMA. Um, it also is a, it also is asking for money for a seasonal vehicle um, and fuel for that vehicle. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're 5,600 from Habitat Council and what's that? 17,000 almost for the PR? Yes. Yeah, is there anything in the images? This is a, a little bit unrelated from the project, but how is Desert Lake doing? Uh, it's it's looking great at the moment. Uh, besides the, the, uh, the other project I'm going to be uh, working on, but uh, we have a lot of water issues on the Desert Lake Waterfall Management Area. Uh, when they when they piped it, um, the canal company when they piped it, we did not get enough connections to irrigate the property as well as fill up our ponds. So, a lot of the sprinklers that were put in have reduced our wastewater capture, and without rains in the summer, we are not looking good. Thank you. So is there any possible future solution to getting more connections, working with the canal company? Um, so I've been working with the canal company. Um, when, so from the time we we're able to accept water in the spring until they shut it off in the fall, we, we have both of our connections going full speed. Um, I've, I've been working with them to try to figure out a way of making a connection that we can pull water from later in the year. Um, kind of like they're talking about with uh, uh, along the Weber River um, to bank it until a little bit later in the year um, so that we can have a separate connection for that. Currently, the pipeline is completely at capacity, so we would not be able to just add one during the growing season. But we're looking at doing one after the growing season if we can except water then. Do you have water sitting out there that you can't get into your project right now? Uh, yes, we have we have extra water at the end of the year um, that we are not able to accept during the watering season through the canal company. So we that, that's, that's going to be a project uh, that probably going to apply for next year is uh, running a pipeline and putting in a connection for that. Okay. Any other questions on this one? So we uh, approve the project. Okay. Second. Okay. We have uh, a motion by Jack, a second from Tyler to approve. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Ocean carries. So yeah, I would encourage you to keep working with that canal company and let's let's get our connections in there. Yeah, we, we've, we've been working with them and they're pretty good if they have extra water for any reason uh, yeah. that they can dump it to us sometimes. That's good to hear. Okay, next one, uh, project 6098, Desert Lake Pond 4 Headgate Replacement. Is that you as well? It is. Hey, go for it. Um, so I was going to uh, start redoing these head gates in the next three years, uh, one a year. Uh, but one of them failed this, this past year when we had some summer rains. Um, 
And so I'm applying to replace all three of them, which I think we're put in at the same time. Um, and that way we can maintain, we can try to keep as much water as possible in this pond um, in case we don't get winter rains. If you zoom out just a little bit on that map, um, you can see that it's one of the few ponds that actually maintains water throughout the year. Uh, there's, you know, four other ponds below that are completely dry. And currently, with the, with the condition that those water structures are in now, uh, we're not able to maintain water in that pond. It's probably about maybe a third of the, the acreage that has water in that pond currently. Um, one of the other, one of the, the one on the uh, northwest side is actually a control structure that allows us to put water into our uh, into our rest pond, which is which is really important uh, to maintain that. There's a canal that runs from the rest pond to the those that control structure that does that. Um, it's the, and w one of the pictures that I put on there is uh, is the actual structure that has got a major hole in it. Um, I'm assuming uh, there was probably uh, muskrats involved with it, but it's definitely rusted out and does not hold water for us anymore. Um, so this is the, if nothing else, we need to replace this here in the coming year. Um, but like I said, I... I'd like to get all three of them replaced at the same time so that we can hold water when we get water. So the labor to put in, is that just from the waterfowl crew? Yes, that's the plan is to uh, contact them and have them put it in for us. Can I, what? Oh, go ahead. Nope. Any questions? I thought the federal was lower or the same, but it's not. All right. No motion. motion will we pass it? Okay. I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion from Steve and a second from Ben uh, to approve this project. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, any opposed say no. All right, motion carries. Okay, we are going to break for a lunch break. Um, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour? What do you think? 45 minutes. Yeah. 45 minutes. We're going to break till, let's say, 12.45 for lunch. And then we will be back on. So thanks, everybody. It will start at 12.45 with Northeastern Region Projects. Is there a question? Oh, yes. Thank you. Hey, I just wanted to let you guys know, um, Daniel, I emailed you a PowerPoint. Um, so if you have time to download it over lunch, it just has some pictures from this past year for Browns Park. Have a great. Great. Okay, thanks. Everybody, we'll see you everybody at 1245.
Cool. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We just got finished with our lunch break, and we're going to start back up uh, with projects from our northeast region. Um, our next project is number 5881, Browns Park WMA Maintenance, FY23. Amy, is that you? Yep, that is. Um, so, so I sent a PowerPoint just with a couple of pictures on in it. Um, I know a lot of you guys probably may have never been out here before, so it just shows a few things of what we do or what have we've done the past year. Pictures are great. Um, yeah. Um, so you can go to the next slide. It should go pretty quick. So last year, um, I drained the Parsons unit um, to try to get their we're starting to see an abundance of carp in the pond. So um, it worked out really good with it being a drought year last year. I was able to drain the ponds and with the heat and everything, they died just naturally. So you didn't have to do any rote known. Um, that's just a picture of a whole bunch of dead carp. Um, this year, I'm gonna try and drain it again, just to try to get any remaining carp that might still be in there. Um, by the time we got it drawn down last year, um, the carp had already hatched from the spawn from that spring. So there are some little ones that we may have missed. So by draining it again this year, we should be able to get them all out of there. And then we'll just monitor it and make sure they don't come back. Um, next slide. Um, so the past couple of years, we've a big part of what I've been having my seasonal do is replace old fencing. Um, on the Bridgeport unit, especially, it's this old like sheet paneling type fence with a barbed wire strand on the top that you can see, kind of see on the left picture. Um, and a lot of the H braces were just, they're getting rotten and falling over. And a lot of the T posts were rot, rotted out on the, or rusted out on the bottom. So they were falling over as well. So we're going in and doing a section a year. Um, this is, the picture on the right is the section we did last year, did about a half mile stretch went in connected with the year before that we replaced with new H braces and new wire, uh, new T posts were needed. Um, this year I might be taking a break from that. Um, we've got the Bridgeport units about two thirds of the way done. Um, I've been having a hard time finding a qualified tech for this year though. So we'll see what I end up getting done this year with fencing. Um, next slide. <coughs> Um, a big problem we were having last year is right by the pumps for Bridgeport. Um, we kept having a beaver or several beavers come in and dam it up. And it kept blocking up where the water intake was for the pump. So we'll hopefully I got them this past fall. Um, I'll find out this spring if there's still any around. Um, but that's a big part of what the seasonal does as well is just monitor for beavers and try to remove them where where we need them. All right, next slide. Um, here's just some cool pictures of the birds um, that use the area. This past winter, we've had about 60 some trumpeter swans using the area, which is pretty cool to see that many in one spot. Um, and then the pelicans really like the ponds and we get different non game birds coming through as well. Um, and I think that's all the pictures I had. So we can go to the project. <clears throat> so this project is just what you've heard the other guys talk about this morning. It's just funding for a seasonal position for five to six months. Um, their main responsibilities up here are the water level management, um, beaver control, spraying noxious weeds, and fencing and replacing signs. Um, so this funding is just money for their um, their paychecks, uh, truck and fuel, and then the materials and supplies for the herbicides, uh, fencing supplies, and any other tools that we might need throughout the year. Um, and then the funding, I just kept it, it's the same as it has been. Um, so it's the same between Habitat Council and federal aid that it's been in previous years. And this is also the same. So it is a big game wintering area. So we do have big game that use it. Upland game, we release pheasants out here during the fall and then waterfowl. All right, any questions for Amy? 
Amy, uh, Amy, I don't know that area. Does it have any native populations of upland game? Wild populations, maybe I should say. Um, so we do have sage grouse up here during the summer months. This isn't in a hunt area though for sage grouse, so they're not huntable. Um, and other than that, for like upland game, um, we have rabbits, <laughs> um, but not uh, not really any native birds. Okay, it, it, that hampers sense just for the put and take then, basically. Yeah. Yep. Amy, how how's the drought situation affected Browns Park over the last couple three years? Um, Last year was the worst I've seen it. I had a really hard time keeping the pond by the house full with any kind of water. Um, just the water coming down Krause Creek was just, it was really low. Um, right now we're, I'm in the middle of, I got a foot of snow on Monday and I'm watching it snow again now. So hopefully it's better this year. Um, Diamond's been getting a lot of water, so we should be getting a lot of water coming down Krause this year. And um the drought did affect a little bit with the pumps. Um, when they decrease flows out of the dam, I can only run one of the Bridgeport pumps at a time because otherwise they suck air and then it just, it's not good for the motors. Um, so we'll see what happens with that this year with the releases from the dam. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Make a motion to edit and approve the project. I'll second it. Okay. <clears throat> I have a motion from Tyler to approve. A second from Steve. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. None opposed. Motion carries. So that one passes. All oh, right. I got a question for her. Mm -hmm. So, Amy, have we kind of abandoned the canal idea for now then? It's um, you mean that big? Yeah, with adding like the fish screen and all that and everything. Um, so, okay, so you're talking about, so the Parsons Canal, um, I have piped part of it. Um, that project went through three years ago, I want to say. Um, so a portion of it has been piped where it was sloughing off really bad every year. Um, the rest of it, I don't think we have a real big need to pipe it um just with a low gradient it'd be tough to make sure it flows fast enough to keep it the sediment from settling out during the yeah. during that long stretch okay thanks okay <clears throat> are you doing the next one too amy yes i am Okay, DA82 Bridgeport Water Control Structure. Go ahead. Okay, so this is on the north side of the river, the Bridgeport unit. Um, it's divided into two ponds, an upper and lower one. Um, the upper one, I can't really keep watering it anymore. The, um, the control structure between the two ponds, it's rusted out, um, the bottom and the ring around where the culvert connects to the bell riser. So this is just to come in, uh, tear the old one out, put in a new concrete structure with a 36 inch HDPE pipe um, embedded in it. Um, that way we can drive across it on that dike safely. Um, right now it's a little, little sketchy with how much has eroded away under like around that pipe and underneath the road. Um, so yeah, this is just to replace a control structure right there. And yeah, there's a picture of it. You can see where it's going around the belt riser now. And it all started, if you could look inside it, it's all rusted out. Um, so the water started going through there first and then started going around it. And seeing a lot of these today. I was going to say you got to have yeah. like a stock. <laughs> 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 This is a good place to park money if we have money at the end of the year. Go buy 20 different water 
control structures. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so the numbers I got for the funding, um, I actually uh, talked with Rich and um, some of the other guys out there and got what their bids had been from previous years. Um, I did add in a little bit more just because of how remote we are to have anyone deliver it out here is going to cost a little bit more. Um, and then our heavy equipment crew on the waterfall, um, is, they're going to come in and tear the old one out and put the new one in. So, so yeah, so the contractual services are for the actually pouring the concrete and then the supplies is it'd be for the pipe to go into it. All right. Any questions? It seems straightforward. I'll make a motion that we tentatively approve this for funding consideration. Second, second motion. Okay, a motion from Justin and a second from Jack. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, opposed? Any opposed say no. Okay, and motion passes. All right. Next one uh, 5703 Perry at Wetlands Water Control. <laughs> Hey guys, um, Daniel, I did send you a map, a screenshot of a map to your email if um, you wanted to pull that up. <clears throat> but um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jordan McMahon. I just took over as the um, Perry at Wetlands manager about three or four months ago. Um, and sort of staying in line with uh, a lot of the projects that have been presented so far. Um, this is just proposing uh, funding for the replacement of a water control structure, a diversion structure that feeds that entire, <clears throat> excuse me, Utland unit that I circled in red there. Um, this is pretty critical for just being able to actually move water into that unit right now. We can't, unless the water is extremely high um, because the diversion structure that's on site has failed, we can't actually get water over there. Um, and, and that presents a few different issues. So uh, for instance, we just burned this this unit like a month and a half ago, um, and we would like to be able to inundate it to sort of help control the, uh, the cattails and, and the rushes that, and the phragmites that are sort of encroaching. Um, and I guess I should mention too, this is a phased project and there are two additional diversion structures that aren't part of this proposal. Um, what would be proposed next year. <clears throat> and um, I guess overall, the Perry at Wetlands is sort of drying up due to uh, changing agricultural practices upstream. Um, so we're just not getting as much water as we used to. So we're just trying to increase the efficiency that we're able to control water with down there um, and sort of start to prioritize some of these ponds um, and, and I guess just some numbers on that Utland unit specifically, um, between 1986 and 2010, um, we were doing monthly waterfowl counts down there and uh, we got about like, like 3,500 waterfowl per year and that's counting one day per month. Um, overall, a species richness of about 12 different waterfowl per month and um, specifically to that Utland unit, that's about like 600 acres of, of pretty high quality wetland habitat. And uh, additionally, production was about like 627 ducklings per year over that 1986 to 2010 period. Um, so this project represents, or proposal, I'm sorry, represents a, a pretty good opportunity to um, really see changes on the ground. These structures have been sort of failing for quite some time as far as I understand. Um, and, and we're sort of being forced to move water around through uh, ditches and canals that weren't necessarily designed to be able to, to move as much water as we're asking them to. So that's sort of causing issues with like the prol proliferation of invasive um, plants and also trees. And uh, it's a pretty big area for waterfowl hunting. We released pheasants there um, in the fall. And um, going forward, there's some opportunities to develop some upland uh, 
sort of croplands that we acquired, um, I guess about eight years ago. And um, so, yeah, um, I guess that's about it. I'm asking for 42,000 from the Habitat Council um, and the same from WRI. And again, this is phase two of a potentially uh, four phased project. So yeah, um, any questions? Hey, Jordan, quick question yeah. for you. Where mm -hmm. this is multi-phase, is there would there be much of a savings in the economy by just getting them all done? I guess where we're at with that, I would say yes. But where we're at with that um, is that we tried to reduce some of the costs. So we had an engineering firm go in there. Well, not me, but I guess my predecessor. Uh, and sort of design these control structures, but they're quite expensive. Um, so in order to cut costs, we are going to be working with um, DWR and, and, and providing some support from our operator. We lost the party. Are you back now, Jordan? I'm sorry, did I cut out there? Can you yeah, you cut out. Okay. Um, basically, I think we're limited by labor to try to save costs, so I don't think we can do more than one per year. Um, and also, the wetlands is usually only dry for like a month per year, so the, the, the window is pretty small when we can actually get equipment in there and, and do this replacement. Okay. And just to branch out a little bit, since you brought it up, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you brought it up, you said you had some area for potential upland yes. um, improvement. What what are you looking at to do there in a future project? Yeah, so I'm looking at probably just planting some, like, I, I, I'm not sure on the exact species, um, but it's pretty near some ponds. So either like, like millet or some swamp timothy or, or something. Um, that we'll be able to sort of just kind of get out there and irrigate a little bit. I'm, I'm hoping to use some like solar pump irrigation. So like more of a passive model. Um, and I guess I'm not sure exactly what the area is, but if you're familiar with period, it's the Felter farm property that was purchased um, about eight to 10 years ago. Um, so just growing like, like food crops for waterfowl, basically. Um, there's a lot of cranes that use the area, so I think they would benefit. What wild uh, upland do you have in that area? I'm sorry? What wild upland game do you have in that area? There's a lot of pronghorn. Um, elk move through, mule deer are there pretty much year round. Apparently there's been a, a moose spotted there, um, black bear. How about upland game? Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, like, are you talking about like birds? I guess yeah. just pheasants yep. as far as I know. I know there used to be some quail um, and chucker, but I don't believe those are, are there anymore. Um, and I haven't personally seen any turkey there. So I, I think it would mostly be focused on pheasants. Okay. Well, that, I would, I'll just do a shout out. If there's something you can do that's going to help up native upland in the area, not just the put and take, uh -huh. I strongly encourage you to do so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I heard you mention that before, so I figured I would bring it up. But um, it, it is an old farm property already, so you know the space is there, the soil's decent. Um, so I, I guess yeah, uh, look out for that maybe next year, or the year after, or after the I guess diversion structures are replaced. Yeah. Sweet, thank you. Yep, thanks. This is Charlie with Friends Forever out in Vernal, hey, and. How are you doing, Jordan? Um, yeah, it's awesome. Proposing this again, and uh, Perriette is a magical place. And um, you know, I haven't been out there in a few seasons just because there hasn't been water. Um, the habitat's there for wild pheasants. There really aren't any, but it is a put and take place. And then you know, there has been um, rumors of wild quail running around there and uh the turkey i think down by the river this does connect with the green river so it's pretty good habitat and um it is a unique place so definitely in support of thanks yeah yeah thanks charlie um yeah I would, I would love to take you down there sometime if you ever want to go certainly
Any other questions? Yeah, so, yeah. So I just want to provide a little history on this for the okay. yeah. couple years ago or last year and asked for three structures and the engineering. He took it out for engineering and it came back to like 120 grand per structure. That's why we this. And so we asked him to go back and talk to our folks. Uh, our heavy equipment crew to see if they couldn't bring the cost down. So he's done a lot of legwork to try to get the cost down. And I think where it's at now is is about as low as, as we're going to see it. And so I, I for one, I'm, I'm a big proponent of this. It's been a long time coming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll make the motion that we tentatively approve it for funding. Okay. I'll second Okay, we have a motion from Justin to approve and a second from Tyler. All in favor, say aye. Uh, aye. And you say no. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Jordan. Um, next one. Thanks. Stewart Lake WMA Eplin's renovation project phase three. Who's got that one? And we saw. Annalise or Charlie? Yeah, I thought Annalise might be on, but I'm I'm here as well. Okay. Oh, there's Annalise. Um, go ahead, Annalise, if you're ready. Um, yeah, this, I mean, I, I'm sorry. This is, I've never been on this on meeting here. before. Um, so yeah, it's I'll down it. in, uh, in Stewart Lake. It's down in, uh, Jensen, Stewart Lake Wildlife Management Area. Um, this is its third year of this project. So it's kind of ongoing. Um, it's in the, it's in the upland portion of the, uh, area. Um, we're just working on treating the tamarisk and other invasive weeds down there to help create a more diverse um, vegetation that uh, upland and ground nesting wildlife can benefit more from. Uh, for this year, um, we're working on to do like a wet mow to finish up treating the tamarisk and a potential seeding and weed spraying, I believe, um, if needed. Um, yeah, I know down there there's uh, pheasant hunting. That Pheasants are stocked there um, during pheasant season. Um, I believe there might be some patches of quail as well, but I know it's definitely used for upland game hunting. Yeah, like Annalise is describing, um, it's been a multi-phase project, um, initially treating the perennial pepperweed invasive species and then the tamarisk. Uh, we're talking about 30 acres in the upland and trying to eventually turn it into a perennial um, grass nesting and then brood rearing more pollinator uh, type ground within those 30 acres. Um, projected maybe that seeding might happen next year what we have to do this year is uh, the growth back of the salt cedars um, has some uh, sprouts and we want to wet mow that um, elim eliminate another round of weed seed uh, from the residual pepperweed and the annual grasses and so forth uh, get a food plot type uh, dried triticale uh, mix and and then next year you know really determine if we can pull the trigger on a you know fall seeding of a perennial mix and maybe just doing half of the acreage next year based on what's coming up but we feel like we can clean up this uh, site fairly well this year and then have an annual food plot going into the uh, following season um, and so yeah this will be third year Okay. 
Any other questions? Is, yeah, wild populations of pheasants, quail down there. Uh, it is a release site. There's also turkey, cranes, waterfowl, and then um, the uh, rare and threatened fish. It's also a brood rearing area for those fish. Thanks for heading off my question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> How many acres is it? 30. 30 yeah. Seems a little high compared to the, what the northern guys were saying. Is there is there more than just spraying going on? or? Uh, what was the question? Um, it seems a little high for 30 acres, 12000 something dollars for 30 acres to spray that. Is there more than just spraying going on or... Oh, yeah, certainly. So, I mean, uh, the schedule of this year is a wet mow application. You know, those usually run to some 300 bucks an acre. Then there's going to be another weed spray attempt, uh, Roundup, you know, a non-selective herbicide. Then there's going to be a fall seeding. So there'll be 30 acres at about a 80 to 100 um, pound per acre rate of triticale uh, seeding in September, October. And so, yeah, there's... Um, and then monitoring involved um, and, you know, other labor from DWR, you know, contributing, I guess. That's not part of the dollar cost. But, um, yeah, three actions. Gotcha. Thank you. All I've seen was a spring. I thought that was a little high, but that makes more sense. Certainly. Any other questions? Um, Annalise, can you tell us your role on this project as well? I didn't get an introduction from you when we started. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I recently just got put as the project manager of it. I remember when I was, and as I understand it, you're the one of the SGI partner biologists, right? Oh yeah, with Pheasants Forever, I'm the SGI person here in the NRCS office. Any yeah, other questions? Annalise took over my position about a year and a half ago out here in Vernal NRCS. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to wrap our heads around, uh, you know, everybody's role there on this one. So I'll make the motion to tentatively approve it. Okay. No, I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion from Tyler and a second from Ben. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Okay, motion carries. All right, thanks you guys. All right, we're gonna move on to our Southern Region projects. Um, project number 6057, Richfield Upland Game and Waterfowl Management Project Phase Nine. Phase Nine, so my name is Kendall Bagley, Habitat Biologist out of the Richfield area. I'll pre be presenting this project again. For some of you, uh, over the course of the last nine years, you or eight years, you've you've heard it and uh, seen it before. So we're just going to kind of continue for the next couple of years. Daniel, if you'll go to images and documents down at the very bottom, just go to the documents. Down at the very bottom, we'll pull up this map. So the, the project is uh, 134 acres. Uh, it's outlined in red and it's owned by Richfield City and UDWR uh, eight years ago went into a lease agreement with Richfield City so each year we lease this property uh, I think around three thousand dollars is what our lease agreement is on it and it's strictly used for open access to hunt upland game uh, pheasants turkeys waterfowl uh, the severe river runs just to the east of it and so it it borders it and um, the hunters have access to the severe river that runs runs through it to the north uh, down on the bottom you can see some well points that are in yellow uh, there's 11 artesian wells so each year we work with eric anderson and um, being the employee of the year that eric is he's always done us a, a great job and getting some water rights transferred from dwr back onto this property and in lieu of that we also take three acre feet from a private Jay, Jay and Camille Ogden donate us three acre feet of water so typically we have 33 acre feet of water associated with this Richfield City so we're able to 
roughly irrigate all 10 to 12 acres of um, of crops on this on this piece of ground. At the top, we have uh, some sheds and corrals, and we have a pump house that we get water out of and associated with the uh, corrals, and we kind of modified them and turned them into flight pens. We have four flight pens, and this project was kind of brought together by SFW, and we ended up putting um, some pen rear birds, and that's what we raise on this WMA, and we utilize them for the general season pheasant hunt and uh, SFW youth hunt. And we send some to Millard County, some go to uh, Wayne County, and obviously a lot of them stay in the Severe Valley. So we've also provided birds for walking access areas within the Southern region. Uh, if you wanna to go to pictures, Daniel. So this is kind of the brooder that we've got put together. SFW's provided the funding for it. Um, it's kind of a Quonset hut. So we've got a big heater you can see kind of suspended there and there and then the watering systems um, moving forward. So that's kind of what it looks like before we get all the Dale chicks. Next. And here's the babies at, at day old. Uh, we raise them in here until they're about five weeks. Once they hit five weeks, uh, we turn them out to the flight pens. And from there, they get the, the blinders put on them. So you can see them here. Um, this is right here in the in the flight pen. So, and from that point until maturity, when they're released in, in November, late October, November, December, um, they'll stay in those flight pens. We've had um, we kind of get the water. Uh, we put it in some totes, kind of some fertilizer totes, and put them on floats. So these birds have have water pretty much all day long, and and uh, drink out of these troughs that's been provided by dedicated hunters for us. Keep going. More pictures of the birds. Uh, you can see the flight pens here. Uh, bring them into the bottom. And so we'll have a mix of, of obviously hens and roosters, about 10% hens over the course of the year. Uh, we'll hold the hens, put out strictly roosters. And then um, after the hunting season, everything goes. So um, we put those out. This is kind of where we catch them here in the bottom. Some of the young kids that we've been able to have help us over the years. Um, it's always a fun time. There's a lot of a lot of kids that's grown up over the last eight years, helping us do this type of work from when they're this age, clear up until you know in their teenage years. Uh, SFW, uh, like I said, has been one of the main supporters along with Habitat Council in the past. Um, so here's some SFW members. Vance Mumford uh, releasing some birds this year on our WMAs. And these birds will, within the Severe Valley, we release them on the Richfield WMA uh, and our Annabella WMA and also the Redmond WMA. And we get a few division birds in here. And so we don't take as many division birds because we're able to raise, raise our own and put out on there. Uh, this is the parking lot on the south end of the WMA. And you can see this is opening morning and, and there'll be 20 to 30 cars pretty much uh, every day down in there. And uh, just allows a lot of open access to a lot of public hunters um, and uh, a lot of youth hunters in this area. Pictures of some hunters that were successful that first day. This is his dad and um, Russ Ivy. Here's a couple youth hunters. Uh, Paul Paul Niemeyer is right there in the in the foreground, and he's with SFW, and he's kind of one of the main leaders of trying to get this project up and going. Vance Mumford's there with the Division of Wildlife, and and two more SFW members. And each year SFW has a Kids Day shoot, and they hold it on our Annabella WMA. So Paul kind of goes over a lot of the logistics and he has a, a trap shooting machine. And, and so we have two different um, kind of schedules for the kids. And so some kids will show up in the morning and then they feed them lunch and then you'll have an afternoon group. And for the most part, the kids all get an opportunity to shoot a lot of clay pigeons out of Paul's uh, machine and, and they go over a lot of safety. And that's kind of what Vance is there for. Here's a group of young hunters on the SFW Kid Day shoot. 
So it's been really successful. A lot of kids come lot back year after year and bring their parents and just have a lot of a lot of fun time. Two more kids this year. Um, little successful hunter, Tyler Ivy, right there. It's a pretty good morning to watch all these kids. Uh, we do a lot of try to do a lot of maintenance, so we we spent a little bit of time uh, planting some corn in in a couple areas. We're able to water, create some some fall feed for them. Uh, we've been able to put these baskets out and put some shrubs. So we've got uh, silver buffalo berry and golden currant, um, wild rose, and um, there's a few olives floating around on this WMA too as well that were that were there initially, and and they provide a lot of winter habitat for the for the birds. This is an area that we, you know, planted and utilized some seed from GBRC, Upland Game. Um, been able to plant that. We do have a few turkeys float around on the WMA. So we've had a hand raise um, three or four hatches of, of chicks there and, and um, even killed a, a couple toms on this WMA in the spring of the year. Mowing, doing a little bit of mowing, kind of trying to keep okay. a little bit of the weeds down uh, associated with our shrubs. And um, like to mention too, we do a lot of work with Sevier County uh, Weed Department. Uh, we spray weeds for white top and and uh, some nap weed, and we've got some annual pepper weed and some thistle on there. So we we do a, a pretty good job each year trying to keep the weeds, noxious weeds, under control. Uh, as you can see, some of the oats and some of the grain barley that we've planted in the past, able to create a little bit of cover. And this is kind of mainly what it's what it looked like when we first got the property. It was grazed down pretty heavy uh, with cattle use, and there's been no grazing in there um, since we've we've obtained kind of the lease on the on the property. But um, we do have a few trespass cows that kind of got the upper hand on our corn this year, so. More opportunities, you know, for for upland game and creating the habitat and the, the forage that they need to get them through the winter months. So here's a kid, and I'll I'll throw a shout out. This is my boy, and so he's on uh, predator control, but he's a lot older and now than he is in this picture. So, but we do do a lot of catching of raccoons and skunks and and things around there, and it hasn't been too bad. Knowing we've got a lot of the pheasants in those flight pens and um use some kind of dog hole traps um we're able to take a few of them each year and and um like i said the probably the worst thing we have issues with as far as our flight pens and and killing our birds is we've got a, a pair of red tail hawks and about three weeks ago we had a few um golden eagles and a, and a bald eagle move through that area so they really play havoc on on our pheasants. So what we're asking for, um, as far as the budgets, 25,456, uh, we're asking roughly around seven, a little over 7,000 from Habitat Council. And mainly what the Habitat Council funding is for, yeah, 79.56 is mainly to take care of uh, the water lease, and, or not the water lease, but the, the lease on the property with Richfield City. Uh, to help with the feed uh, as far as, uh, or the seed that we, we put out for the birds, uh, corn that we plant and chemical. Uh, pretty much SFW each year typically funds the whole entire project. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll have them split that out. So the cost from SFW is strictly for the feed and the well-being of the birds. Uh, Habitat Council money is not allocated towards that the habitat council money strictly stays on on the wma to help us with that so any other questions kendall what's uh um how long does this lease go till well, maybe you answered this last year and i just don't remember but you know with this we started out with a five-year lease and um so we got two more years it's over in 2023 and it'll be 10 years and we just had a brand new mayor in Richfield City. Um, the city council has changed this year. Um, 
So I'm guaranteed at least two years. And I just finalized kind of a statement of work, working with Angie and Ann Sleep from state purchasing on some feed um, to kind of guarantee us for the next two years uh, to feed feed these birds. Um, but yeah, I only have a, a two more uh, two year lease left. What do you think is going to happen after that? Just out of <laughs> I don't know. I've myself, Vance Mumford, we've been there uh, for ten years almost, and um, so I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I'm I'm hopeful. You know, if if the local SFW chapter here in in Richfield. Um, it's just paid great dividends. Our budget doesn't get much more than the 25,000 each year. Um, we've got a lot of dedicated hunters and a lot of volunteers that we, that help us maintain this and, and kind of help, you know, to, to raise the bird, not really raise the birds. Well, kind of raise the birds and then kind of trap and relocate them, you know, and get them out to release. That's kind of where we, we rely on those guys because we need the extra help. But uh, as far as that, I don't know. I, I can't really tell you where that lease may go um i'm sure there's you know if sfw wants to continue you know there's probably an opportunities to to go back to richfield city um uh we get a lot of we get a lot of our neighbors that that want to graze it and i think uh, i had this discussion with vance the other day and i think there's opportunities for us to graze this we're getting a lot of kind of some older thatch uh around and and i think there's opportunities to to lightly graze it certain times a year that would help improve this WMA. Obviously they don't have any water. And so we'd have to work out those details if we decide to do it. But um, originally that's what it was, you know, guys dumped their cattle in there and it was pretty much like the desk you're sitting on. I mean, it was just bare when we got it. And so it's, it's definitely come a long ways and it's, it's been a great interest for a lot of people. Everybody knows where they can go and hunt and you know there's a lot of access to a lot of kids and, and a lot of adults and, and a lot of people. And we've spent a lot of this money right there local within the Severe Valley. And and um, so everybody pretty much knows about the pheasant farm in Richfield Valley and and kind of what, what goes on. So I, I can't really tell you, you know, obviously I think it'll pertain to SFW if they're kind of done with the project, if they want to move on, you know, that, that might be something we'll have to discuss hopefully probably next year. But for right now, that's we've got two more years on that lease. So Kendall, get your your schmooze on with the city council and the mayor. <laughs> Now's <the> time. <laughs> this is Gary. I was going to jump in on that. I'd say our intent is to extend the lease or make a pitch that we would actually like to purchase the property. That takes a willing part, partner on the other end, but our intent is to to continue. Thanks, Gary. Any other questions? Yeah, Kendall, this is Randy. I, uh -huh. I was just curious. One, I, I've never been to your facility down there, but it's obviously having a big impact on especially youth hunters, which is great. Um, I was curious on one of the comments you made in your details, um, saying that you're monitoring bird survival. It obviously wasn't at the WMA, but it's some of the other areas. I was just curious what you're referencing there and what you're seeing. Yeah, so every bird that comes out of there each year, we've got a different band on our birds. So each bird's banded. So it gives us an opportunity if we do see them out in the field, we know what year um, each one of them has been banded for a different color coded. So, um, you know, that gives us an opportunity to do some monitoring uh, right now, you know, in the, in the snow and, and some of that stuff, we're able to go out and see, see tracks, kind of see what's in there. You'd be surprised how much they move, um, especially as hard as these areas get hit, you know, once we release the birds. Um, man, they, they just disperse. And so we've got a lot of private, there's a lot of river cover. There's a lot of olives to the south of us along that Hepler's pond, you know, a lot of sloughs, uh, things of that nature that those birds just kind of, they actually kind of would move off uh, that area. And then once the pressure's kind of relieved, you'll see them float back. But, you know, if we're able to monitor them, that's kind of our, our trigger point is, is looking for banded birds on the, on, on this Richfield WMA or the, the Annabella WMA when we go to get them released. Okay, I was just good. You seen any sign of uh, nesting success? Have you? Um, you know, yeah. Last year, the first couple of years was really good. Um, last year, just as dry as it was, uh, we just didn't see a lot associated with that um, back and forth. So we do see them float around. You know, when we're out there 
um, you know, a couple of days ago when me and Vance were out there, you could hear them, the birds cackle and, and see them. But to go out and really, you know, look for that, I haven't done that um, this last year. Okay. I was just curious because Pine Ridge birds are notoriously bad nesters. So I was just <laughs> curious if you've seen something. Yeah, we try to try to work around the nesting and give them all the benefit we can as far as um, working, uh, either working up the land and trying to get stuff prepped for for in the spring to plant or even when we take our water. We're able to take our water, the uh, I think, the first of April until the end of October. And so we try to work around, you know, kind of that nesting period, too, as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Eric, I think I'm ready to make a motion. Mm -hmm. I'll second Okay, so we have a motion from Justin and a second from Tyler. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. Okay, motion passes. Next hey, thanks project. a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kendall. Uh, 1696 Pavant WMA Fence Replacement Phase 2. Go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, who is this? Hey, this is Lindsay back down in Delta. How are you? Good. Good to have you on, Lance. Good. Sorry, I got a, we, don't, we don't have the visual of who's on, so I'm just hearing voices, like I usually well, do. Okay. Um, anyway, hello well, to you guys. I, I, I have a PowerPoint I, I, in there I, I, that I'd like to show. Okay. Go ahead, Lynn. OK, perfect. Yeah. Um, Basically, how I'd like to do it is just go through all of my areas, talk about what's going on, and then present the, you know, the money part of it at the end. So if that works okay, that's kind of how I've done it in the past. Um, start off kind of with the, the first bit about Big No, we'll move to Redmond, go to the Pabon Upland Game Area, and Clear Lake. So uh, if we could just look at the first picture. This is Bicknell Bottoms. Um, it's in county. It's come a million miles. It's about 600 acres of some upland and a lot of wetland. Uh, when, when I stepped foot over there for the first time, the cows were overgrazing it so bad, they were eating the, the bark off the cedar fence posts. It was just unbelievable. So uh, if you look at this, this area right here, you can see Done. We have eastern red cedars growing there. We have Great Basin wild rye. We have cover. We have uh, woods rose, golden currant. We have some large ditches that we have put in that water the trees and shrubs. And we've developed about 40 acres of really nice upland game habitat right there. Um, it's it's uh, just amazing what removing the cattle and some good management can do there. Um, we're raising uh, grain and hay and grass and pheasants and quail in addition to our waterfowl. Okay, go to the next picture, please. This is uh, part of the beautiful wetland out there. I don't know where you can find a prettier marsh than that. Uh, Currently, the, we're, we're in a kind of a some, some intense meetings with the uh, county commissioners about backing water up on private ground. We're trying to work through those issues with some, you know, some uh, different ideas about what we can do there. But Bicknell is 600 acres of just a variety of different type of great habitat. It uh, provides a lot of nice hunting in the central part of the state for waterfowl there's quite a few geese that are shot there it's a good duck hunting area it's it's good early and late in the season it's a wonderful marsh so we're just trying to manage it and make it the best that we can for, for waterfowl upland game and fishing okay go to the next one this is a closer look at the ditches uh, if you look closely there you can see the different species of Eastern red cedar, uh, buffalo berry, pea shrub, grass. I mean, this day I jumped a nice big rooster out of there that had made it through the hunt and through the season. 
We also have a holding pen there that we uh, get some of the SFW birds from and keep them throughout the, the year, raise them up and let them go. So um, Bicknell is, uh, Bick is a wonderful area. Okay, next picture. This is moving on down the road to our Redmond uh, wildlife management area. This is another 600 acre um, upland slash waterfowl area that's located near the town of Redmond, if you know where that is. Uh, we have fenced it off. We've taken it from being just an overgrazed, uh, another property to uh, another place where we have the Sevier River that borders it on one side. This is a project where we got 10 pheasants from uh, SFW, purchased them in the summer, and we took them out there and let them go on the river. Uh, that's Heather helping me and my, my temporary helper there. We, we released them right by the river, and uh, you know we really don't know how good they did, but at least they had a great chance. They had water, they had food cover, and hopefully those hands can make it through and, and help us out with some reproductive effort there. Uh, we release DWR birds there, in addition to SFW pheasants there. We also provide the waterfowl hunting on a few small impoundments. And um, it's just a, a really beautiful, nice area that that gets a lot of hunter use, mostly from upland game hunters right there. Okay, go to the next one, please. This is moving on over to the Pavon upland game area. The Pavon is 960 acres. We own it, we take care of it. Uh, it's, it's just a, a constant uh, big, Big job and a lot of work and a lot of good things going on there. Um, this is the a flight pen that we built. It was the first flight pen that was put in on a WMA that I know of, and it, it really helps a lot. The flight pen becomes home base to these pheasants. So we get SFW chicks, we put them in this pen, we raise them up, then when the hunt comes, we can go. The birds that aren't harvested harvested immediately make it back there to the pen, hang out around it. They they come and they go, and it it really it really works out great. Okay, picture at Pavant. Uh, this is some of the stuff that that I'm spending the money on. Um, I had a member all over there from a, a dairy and. The, the ground needs a lot of help, but it, it's good ground. It's just very dry. So this particular couple of slides, I, I had like 700 tons of manure hauled over and spread on the area to try to, you know, help help the dirt, help things grow. The thing that I like about uh, spreading manure and, and taking care of that, the soil that way is that it, it really affects it for many years. That's, that's what I really like about manure, is I can put manure out there and 10 years later, I can see exactly where I put that manure because it's making the grasses grow better. It's helping the grain. It's helping anything that, that I can get that manure around. So, you know, with that, is it, it is expensive, but I think it's really, you know, really, really worth it. Um, so that, that's been a good project, okay. Go to the next one. This one is uh, was a new idea for me, and it was really fun. I went and I, I got some, I got permission to go down uh, by a place here in Delta called the DMAD, and I thought, you know what? I was hunting pheasants along there, and, and I just went on to this Russian olive nursery. I'm a big olive fan, and I'm not scared to admit it. Um, I took the tractor out. I dug trees that were probably five years old. I pruned them down. Uh, of course, I got stuck, which is a common, you know, common theme of mine. It seems to happen every time. So that was like a two-day stuck. And I I loaded and, and cut and loaded, dug, and and I got just some nice trees that I figured I was getting like five years worth of growth out of. 
And once again, I had permission to go do this. So it, it was it was just all fun and a new idea. So go ahead to the next spot, next picture. So of course, when every tree that I plant, I, I kind of preach this every year because it's it's really important. I dig the hole and then I line that hole with chicken wire. Now the chicken wire protects that root system from the gophers. Without it, I could throw every tree away that I have on the foot pond. I have to do that. It's so simple and it takes care of the gophers. It lets those trees get their root system established and then they can they can grow and begin to to establish without you know, your tree might make it a couple of years, but it won't make it five years without being off with the root. So I dug the hole, I planted the trees, I put chicken wire in there with them. You can kind of see that uh, that I got a bigger tree there. I, I bet that tree is four to five years old. And that's really what I was looking for was free trees and more, you know, I'm putting more uh, time in the ground. Okay, go ahead, next picture. That's the same tree that you were just looking at. So the tree row is uh, probably, oh, 500 yards long. And now I probably gained five years of time digging up those bigger trees and putting them in there. So each, each tree at the Pavon, I have a water system set up and I'll show you that. But I, the Pavon is very dry. And so I have a, a PV pipeline at each tree. I have a 560 force hole drilled in the pipe. And then I can water like from oh, 75 to 90 trees in two hours with that drip system. I have over 3,000 trees on the bottom. Take care of that way. So I really like this project. I thought it was something new and it really it really worked well. Okay. Next one. How about that picture? So that's that's my trees. That's the kind of habitat right there. That was bare dirt when I started. So that those tree lines have olives, buffalo berry, pea shrub, eastern red cedar, a variety of, of different trees that, that are growing there. So you can see that the, the olive provides a great food source and a great deal of cover here in, in arid, hot southern Utah. Okay, the next one. This is kind of fun too. Um, you can see the, the photo without the sunflower in it. If you look and see the the, uh, the grass uh, growing on the ground there. What's what's unique about this is that is uh, Great Basin Wild Rye, Alcar tall weed grass that, that is going to provide some wonderful habitat for help and gain. Um, what's neat is I planted this in the spring and it made it which is just remarkable to me to think that somehow that grass made it through that last summer. And now this year, after I fertilize it, it will, it will really take off. The sunflower, I plant a lot of sunflower. I have good doves at Pavon. Um, it's a wonderful species too that really helps a lot of wildlife. Everything seems to like sunflower. So that's basically what I'm trying to do there is plant woody cover, with my rows and put grass everywhere I can, in addition to some uh, grain, some you know, dry land wheat is what I what I'm trying to grow. Okay, next one. This is the Pavant Upland Game Area. Um, just typical Saturday. Uh, you can see the hunters out in the field which I think is really cool. Um, you know, they're, they're walking through the, the wild rye and the grasses, uh, hunters coming up and down the road. Everybody, like I say, it's 960 acres, so there's a lot of ground there. And it goes from everything from rolling grass hills to sagebrush and washes, and it's got all kinds of stuff in it. Now, 
one of the other reasons that I want to look at this picture is that fence that you can see right there is pretty crappy. And it's part of one of my proposals is to get that fence replaced. Uh, it's probably been there for 70 years. Oh, it's on, on that one. We've replaced a lot of other fence at Pavant, but that one also needs it. Okay. Next. This is really uh, been a neat thing. Uh, Sportsman Fish and Wildlife approached me many years ago about what, what they could do to help with pheasants. And I told them that I wanted our, our youth day back to where we had a specific day that we could plant pheasants and have new hunters. I set this up to where it wasn't kids, it's any new hunter. So I don't care how old you are, and all you have to do is you consider yourself a new hunter, you can come and go there. So I like seeing the moms, I like seeing the cousins, the older people that are coming out and trying to, to harvest a pheasant on this day. Um, and, and age isn't a, re a requirement here. So it's worked really good. SFW's provided these birds. SFW also contributes some money to me for extra pheasants that I purchase from either Hats or, or Four Mile to um, increase the opportunity on my areas. I guess that's just because they like me, <laughs> I think. So SFW has been great about this. All right. This is a nice walkthrough that I made this, this last year, um, kind of see the beginning and the end. The only reason I put that up is, is because that's going, um, I build it and it's, it's in our fencing um, proposals, but to go buy out enough material for four walkthroughs and it's a thousand bucks. So, you know, it just costs money to keep this rolling and try to make it better all the time. For, for different hunters. So that's that's the beginning and the after of the walkthrough. I just want it Pavlon. I got three more to do. Okay. Next one. This is the new fence that you guys provided last year. Uh, you can see the old fence that was supposed to keep cows out. And now you can see the new fence where I'm stuck. <laughs> So um, anyway, that was that was really a nice new fence that we got put in there, and I really appreciate it. So you can see what it was and what it is now. Okay. Looks good, Lynn. The road's on the other side of the fence. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say, Lynn. You should have been on the road. <laughs> Maybe less walkthroughs and more drive trust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, how about that picture? Look at that. I don't know, maybe maybe a lot of you have never been to Clear Lake. Clear Lake's the greatest wetland in the world. And it's, uh, I, had a, I had one of my uh, critics in Delta say, Lynn thinks that he's worked at the Garden of Eden. And you know what, that was a really good description. I really like that. Uh, you know, it, it's struggling with lack of water. Um, it's fed by aquifers. They're constantly getting tapped. Um, we desperately need to push for a, a water management plan for the Pavant Valley. I know we've got a crack, uh, crack wonderful water uh, rights guy, employee of the year, and I'm <laughs> sure he's helping out with that. Okay, next picture. This is some of the stuff going on at Clear Lake. Uh, it's just a really pretty picture of dog fetching a nice mallard off of there. Um, Perfect, perfect place at times. It, it's just wonderful. Okay, go ahead. Actually, this is a fence. Another part of our our uh, proposal is this replacing this fence. It's not a very good picture of it, but you can see that I'll bet you that fence has been there for 80 years. It's on the very north end of Clear Lake. It's still our property, you know, and, and we need to get that up and fixed. Uh, that that section is just terrible. The the uh, alkalinity wicks up through these wood posts and comes out the top. It's just incredible. 
So that that's part of what we need to do to uh, to finish fencing off of Clear Lake. Okay, next one. Um, these are the trees and shrubs that I purchase. This uh, this is also part of my budget. I like to have like uh, five thousand dollars worth of trees at my house. I try to plant ten. 10 trees a day um, on my areas. Planting's easy, taking care of them is harder. Um, you can see there the Eastern Red Cedar, Buffalo Berry, Olive, um, which are my favorite. And just a smorgasbord of what we've got, I'll put in what can survive and what can make it. Um, Buffalo Berry too. Golden Current has become a new favorite of mine. That is one tough shrub. Okay, next one. This is just quickly, once again, um, you can see down in the bottom corner of the PVC pipe with the red sprayed on it. That is where the water comes out for the tree. So the, the one side is the before and the other side is the after. So I plant the trees with chicken wire and then I put tree protectors on them. And it's, I'm trying to do this to last a hundred years. That's my goal. Everything that I'm doing, I want it to be around in 100 years. And so it's done correctly. It's done to the best of my ability and put together to last a long time. Okay, you can go to the next one. That is a after tree shot. Go, go to the next picture. Oh, okay, well back to the last one. That's that's a cornfield. Can you go back? That's my cornfield. That's uh, those trees. I've got a great picture of, of them uh, in that ditch before it was planted and then when it was planted. And you can see that they're coming along nicely now. And it's a, it's a wonderful windbreak. It's a great place for wildlife. It's got a corn, my cornfield, which is a lot of work at Clear Lake and a lot of hunter opportunity go into that cornfield. And typical day, I've got the chicken wire in the back, the trees. That's just what we do, just work, get it done. Okay, next one. This is a manure haul at Clear Lake, so the same type of thing. That manure is put out on both uh, areas that are going to grow corn and areas that are going to grow grass. Okay. Okay. So this particular hunter drives from Phoenix to come to Clear Lake to hunt pheasants. Pretty crazy. Next one. First pheasant for Heather this year. Sure. Thought it was really awesome. She came down there and tromped hard and got one and missed a couple. So that was, that was really cool. Really, uh, you know, it's a nice place to come and, and I can't say get away from the crowds because there's always someone there. But Clear Lake is 6,150 acres. So there's a lot of room there. To, to hunt, leg out, and do what you want to do. Okay, next one. This family drives down every Saturday from North Ogden. It, it's, their, it's their life. They pass up all the WMAs come to Clear Lake. And they do well. They run their setters. They're they're made, they're a good hunting outfit. Okay, next one. Hmm. So that picture kind of says a lot there. Even at Clay Lake, you can find porcupines in olive trees. I think there's only one thing that don't like olives, and that's people. Everything else uses them. <laughs> okay, next one. Yeah. 
So where are the deer? Pretty cool. Next one. This is a, a nice annual field trip that we do for the elementary schools. Come down and we do a great tour of Clear Lake, show them, show them around, show them the wildlife, show them what's there. It's amazing how many people live in Delta and have never been to Clear Lake unless they come as a school tour. Uh, you know, it, it gets a lot of use from up north and a lot of people make it down there and, and visit that oasis. Okay, next one. It's kind of fun. This is this is our duck trap at Clear Lake. Uh, in uh, about ten years ago, I decided to try it, and I built this big ugly trap, and it works like a charm. Um, every year we trap all different types of waterfowl. We band them and let them go. And then we're able to see the data and, and where they come, how long they live, where they travel. And uh, it's just super, super awesome experience. Uh, you're all welcome to come and try it with us. Uh, I do it about once a week starting as soon as the hunt's over. So it's ongoing right now. And uh, last week we caught 179 ducks. We caught about 100 mallards, um, 35 pintail, and 35 green wing teal. I should have a really cool video right here if things are working. We try that. There's my super, uh, super supervisor. That that is just a stud duck right there. That is a cinnamon teal. It's the first one we caught out of the trap this year. It had it was banded. And uh, I don't know where it was banded yet, but it it's uh, band was so cool because it was just like it had been sandblasted. I don't know where that duck had been. I'm curious to find out, but really, really neat. Okay, go to the next one. Is there a video? Go. Click on that. Well, try the next one down. 34, maybe. Huh. Daniel, I sent oh. a second one later. I don't know if you got the second one that had the video embedded. Oh, you guys are so computer savvy and smart. Look at that. Okay, try that. Oh, yeah. Hopefully this will go. This is uh, this is last week. We had the the uh, animal service guys there. Watch how great they catch ducks. Now I say that in a in a smiling way. Here comes the net. Look at those ducks. Widgeon mallards. Here comes the effort. <laughs> you tried hard <laughs> kind of funny um that's the trap uh i bait it with corn and wheat and um <clears throat> you know it works it's uh it's just one of those things where it's college effort and uh we catch we catch incredible ducks there if you think about it they're on their mic journey and they're just stopping over at Clear Lake for a while. We catch them and put them in those crates right there and take them out and uh, band them and let them go right on site. So um, super, super good science is coming out of the, the band. And um, I say, if anybody's ever interested in coming and doing this, I just get a hold of me. Come down and try it. Come and see Clear Lake. It's just awesome. So uh really that's kind of what i have and then within all that are my proposals you know 
Lynn, I love that video of Teresa. Her face was great. <laughs> like she was doing something she shouldn't have been doing. That was awesome. <laughs> it was a video for us, Lynn. I love it. She's, uh, she's so much fun, and she is just my best helper. And she keeps me out of a lot of trouble. So I really appreciate her. All my supervisors are great. So, Lynn, I, the the slideshow is awesome. It's good to see all the good work that you're doing. Um, I really appreciate that, and uh, and see the passion and still. Your yeah, yeah, your enthusiasm that. is awesome, and your love for your job, Lynn. I'm impressed. Well, thank you very much. I'm the I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Hey, Lynn, we do have a defensive driving course as well. Um, <laughs> it, it, you need to take that again. <laughs> You know, I, I, uh, I tried really hard not to doink my truck, but I'll tell you what, I can, I can get things stuck. And are you guys familiar with like Gold Rush and Street Outlaws and and the kind of language that they out once in a while that comes out of my mouth the same way when I'm stuck? But it it happens. <laughs> No, I appreciate that, Lynn. It's it's good to see good accomplishments and and whatnot. So, back on the, the project um, for the the WMA fence replacement phase two. Is there anything else you want to say about that, or go through the budget on that, maybe? Oh, it's uh, it's just well needed, and we just need to protect our you know our our areas, especially. Uh, we, I, I'm not a big cow grazer. I think that I've got other ways to manipulate habitat other than letting somebody's cows on there. So I like to have have my areas to where I can control it. And if I want cows on there, then I want to put them on there, not when the neighbor wants to graze it. So that's how I feel about it. Just we need to really have control over it. Okay. Any questions for Lynn on uh, this fence project? I've got one. Is it not PR eligible? Yes. Help me out. I, I don't know, Gary. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. So this, the Pavant WMA was not purchased with uh, PR funds. And so typically we've not applied PR funds on that one. And so we've kept Pavant separate. And I've done that with the fence proposal as well. Um, we'd probably have to ask whoever our federal aid coordinator is now if a project like that could be eligible but but because the property was not purchased with pr funds like the others we've steered away from it i think it has to be tied to pr properties isn't it the species yeah it's more yeah. of a species and activity but i guess we could always check with the habitat employee of the year not that he would know but we should check with them anyway <laughs> <laughs> so. that'd be nice no he was he's big enough as well. <laughs> Maybe I think it's okay to add to it. <laughs> Third. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he was listening. Oh, I love it. It. Okay. Do we have I'll make the motion to tentatively approve it for funding consideration. Okay. I second. Okay. We have a motion from Tyler and a second from Drew to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Okay. Motion carries. Passed. Okay, we're moving on to the next one. You want to do Let's all of these? Let's do all of those. You'll have to switch. Get, put your phones in on me, please. Okay. So <laughs> then you're on uh, FY23 waterfowl and up, upland WMA maintenance. Yeah, that's that's what I'm asking for to care about. Okay. Um, but so the slideshow showed all of these, and so yeah. um, I'll make a motion to approve this. I'll second the motion. Okay, holy, right? Huh? Holy, all of them. It's real. Okay. I thought yeah. we were just looking at six yeah, zero eight six. individually. Just looking at the budget, it looks straightforward. It's on the list. That's all. The okay. motion is for second. Okay, Justin, motion second from Jack. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Say no. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Hey, I, yeah, this, I, I said I, so I'm not saying no, but I didn't get my mute off quick enough. Lynn, through your presentation, and I'm going to echo great enthusiasm. I love somebody that loves their job. Um, in all the areas that you're working, aside from the put and take, what are your wild game numbers like as far as upland birds go? Well, that'd be quite on, and I'd love to say they're doing fantastic. Uh, you know, put and take is it is a wonderful thing, and sometimes it really works. Now, I'm going to tell you honestly, I have banded hen pheasants, and I have seen those banded hen pheasants that, that were pen reared birds with broods of pheasants that they have hatched, and they, you know, I don't know if those chicks made it to be adults, but I have seen those banded hens with chicks. So um, it, it can happen. I, I have a pretty good number of pheasants at Clear Lake. I have some at Pavant. I wish there were more. And, and I also have quail. At, at Pavant, I have really good doves. You know, it's, it's hot and dry. And uh, so I do get some. I wish there were more. How's that? Yeah, no, and, and that's fine. And none of these are shots at put and take. I get the purpose of put and take, but boy, I sure, you know, echoing what I said earlier, things that we can do to, gr to grow native populations are just good, which you're doing. Yeah, I mean, you're doing the right things. I just hoping to see things bear fruit. Well, thank you. And, and me too. And the only, you know, one of the things at Clear Lake, the only thing that has changed at all is water. And when I have more water, I have more pheasants. It's not like that there's a, a new subdivision being built and wiping out the habitat. It's water. Water is the key. And and the more we get, the more we look like a genius. Some year it's all going to turn around and go great. Right now it's 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 struggling. But uh, that that's the thing that changes is uh, when we lose our water, we lose our birds. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, we're looking at the budget for number 6087. Um, I don't know if you can scroll. So, you know, so what, 35? Do you have a motion on this one? I'll make the motion again. I'm going to it. Okay. Second it. Okay, we have a motion from Tyler and a second from Steve. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Say no. No, I voted in favor of this and the one, not the last one, but the one before. But I would just make a note that if we can use PR and if we if we get a bump this year, we ought to explore that. I'm so, at the bump. Um, on that first one. Both yeah. of them are Pavant. 1696. Correct. We yeah. never use it on Pavant, but that'd be nice if we could. I don't know, yeah, I don't know why we couldn't. Why we couldn't. I think it just needs to be written into the PR grant. And I think I think Blair is the one that writes that grant. Just make sure that that area is included. I'll chat with Blair about it. Okay, um, sixty eighty eight budget. I'm go with that one. Now this one should be PR eligible, even if mm -hmm. the old rules apply. <clears throat> so clearly, yeah. So this one's more specific about. <clears throat> about uh, the dike and the fence replacement that's a big chunk of change too um any questions on this one thoughts i just make the motion to approve it but change it to 75 25 pr habitat council okay we, we have a second. second okay got a motion from tyler to approve a second from Steve, uh, to change the budget to 75% PR and 25% Habitat Council. What what percentage do you want that breakdown of the Habitat Council person? Uh, just keep what he has. Yeah, just keep what he's got. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Say no. Okay. And, and again, the only reason I bring it up is it feels like the waterfowl accounts and the upland accounts get used pretty quickly and so yeah they do okay we're going to go back up the list to 6756 squish Lake hydrology and vegetation enhancement 
who's got that one? Is that Gary? Yeah, I'll cover this one. Um, okay. This is a project uh, brought to us by the Bureau of Land Management out of the Cedar City Field Office. Dustin Shively, their wildlife biologist, has been working on this area for several years now. Um, really cool area. You go out west of Cedar City in the valley just before you hit the mountains again. Uh, the, the low point in the valley collects water every year. Um, definitely every year is different, uh, but having just had one of the worst drought years, I was out there a week, week and a half ago with my kids just exploring, playing in the sand, and there was still a good puddle out in the middle and a lot of, a lot of waterfowl and a lot of ducks out there. Um, they've taken this area that was just kind of flooded every year and they've been working on um, just developing it, trying to make it a little bit better, um, develop things like parking, develop um, upland game type areas, and just trying to make it more accessible to people. Yeah, so if you run through those pictures, you can kind of see some of the parking lots and things. One of the really cool ones when you get to it, um, last year they put together some islands out in the in the the area. Yeah, here. Uh, went out in the areas as when it was dry and, and just pulled up uh, about 10 different islands out in there. And like I said, I went out there with my kids about a week and a half ago uh, just to check it out. And um, this area was flooded then at that time. And there were geese all over those islands, just just loving it. Um, and it, with part of this phase three, Dustin wants to go in and do some vegetation on those islands now and help grow that up, make it a little more stable and a, a little more available. Um, really a, a cool resource in Cedar City. I, I grew up loving to hunt waterfowl at Utah Lake, moved to Cedar City and kind of gave it up in all honesty. I, I know you just listened to Lynn talk about some great areas just a little bit further than I was willing to drive. A uh, week and a half ago, uh, I was there with my 12-year-old son, and I said, hey, how would you would you like to take up waterfowl hunting? And we realized we've got a spot 20 minutes from home that we can do that still. And and so really uh, an exciting thing from my perspective, looking at it in new eyes and new opportunity, it, it provides an opportunity for a community that didn't have, have that opportunity there, and it's improving it across the board. So phase three um, really is focused on um, a new parking area, uh, continue with tamarisk removal. They've done a lot of tamarisk removal already and they want to continue with that. And then uh, a wetland seed mix um, with those islands and some of the areas uh, and some upland seeding in the areas where tamarisk removal has taken place. Uh, I should also mention uh, this is the, the, the area that we do put and take release pheasants on in the Cedar City area as well. So it's added, added one more area that's available and tying into another larger community here in southern Utah. We go up and we try to steal as many pheasants from that Richfield facility as we can without Kendall and Vance knowing. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, it looked to me like on the uh, the map or the photograph as though the uh, the lake basin is much larger than the area covered. Did it historically, did the lake cover all of that in recent memory or is it uh, so it's it's an any given year type of situation. There's multiple um, tribute. I don't even want to call them tributaries. It's the end of the line for for Cole Creek, for Church Canyon, and a number of things that, that get there. But it gets intercepted by a lot of things. So high water years, we see water all the way out to Highway 56. Normal water years, it it does decent. And then a drought year like this, uh, if you see those kind of the black there at the bottom end, that's about all. That, that last little L is about the only place water exists on it right now. So it's a it's called a lacustrine wetland coming and going, but it's it's lake more like a lake, uh, but but definitely comes and goes depending on the amount of water available any given year. Are there any uh, water rights associated with it? No, it's just the end of the just the end of the line. So this is just BLM. It's not a WMA then, is it? Correct. Yeah. It's BLM land. They've also started, they have that groundwater recharge project too that takes the Cole Creek end of the line. And so I don't know how much that takes away from Quichapa, but that's been going for a while too that they put that water into the ground. Yeah. And so it, in theory, and you know, I've not seen how it plays out, but that, that there's a, an injection well essentially about where about where that yellow dot is. That's, I think that's a parking lot, but but just to the north of that. Iron County Water Conservancy District has an injection well, and they're they're trying to put as much water back into the aquifer as they can. Uh, but there's an agreement of some sort, and 
this is where when I'm not the project manager, I don't have the details, but I know there's some sort of an agreement that is trying to provide for getting water into the into the lake as much as they can too. There, there's dreams of someday doing kayak rentals and all kinds of things. Um, not sure how they pull that off until they can guarantee water there a little more often, but but it's definitely even at a worst point, definitely providing some great waterfowl benefits out there. And on its best years, it's an incredible little wetland. Okay. We have motion on this one. I moved to approve. Okay. With motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, with motion from Drew to approve and a second from Jack. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Amen or opposed? Motion carries. My said Justin Shannon. Okay, two more projects. We're going to go to Central Region. Thanks, Southern Region, for our the good presentations. Thanks, Lynn, for the the enthusiasm and and the good work. And uh, we appreciate that. So we're going to move to Central Region now. Um, looking at uh, 6071 Utah Lake Hunter Angler Access Improvements. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so the Hunter, uh, this, my, my name is Eric Ellis. I'm the Executive Director of the Utah Lake Commission. Uh, thanks for uh, entertaining this. Uh, so Utah Lake uh, is a pretty phenomenal waterfowl and even upland game area, the surrounding areas of the lake. Uh, we've got 665,000 people right a, adjacent to the lake within, on average, less than 30 minutes. Uh, but we have some pretty uh, uh, rough access points. So there's 20 access points for hunters and anglers on Utah Lake uh, that aren't the marinas. And five of those are the ones that we wanted to focus on this year uh, to do some improvement work. Uh, the roads are, are failing. We've got fences that have problems and we need signage uh, to be enhanced so that people know uh, that, they're, that they've arrived where they need to arrive. Uh, a lot of the invasive stuff we can we can work on with our dedicated hunters, uh, but the roads themselves need to be regraded and material added. And so that's what we're asking for on this particular um, grant for these five access points. So we have Lincoln Point, we have Mill Race, uh, we have Mulberry Beach, uh, Mesita Acres, which is also known as Milepost 13, uh, and Swede Lane. Uh, so if you wanted, uh, I had somebody, we sent in a map link. So this just shows the various different access points. So right over by the highway is the mill race access point by DABC to the right. That's not on our project, but <laughs> uh, in Provo Harbor or in Provo Bay there. So the, or you can actually click to the left on the, on the map links. But yeah, that one there. So if you arrow down, you'll see uh, mill race. So you can just click on those and that'll zoom you in. Just those red pieces. So yeah, sweet lane. Uh, so again, grading these road access points, enhancing the parking. So bringing in some road base for those parking areas. Uh, and, and then we'll work on installing the new fence uh, sections that are in disrepair and doing the kind of the invasive um, vegetation management. So we've got trees that are invading, we've got other types of uh, vegetation. Uh, we utilize dedicated hunters for uh, these various projects. But again, this tackling the bigger job of, of getting those access roads and parking areas enhanced is what we could use the the contracted work that would be funded with this grant. All right. Any questions for Eric on these? Is uh, is there participation from the county on this? Uh, the county is is the landowner on these, uh, and we usually can get them to come in, but we have not uh, identified their participation through our our finance page. They helped us put together the estimates, uh, and and this year ahead, they they're packed with with work with their public works crews, and so we couldn't get them to 
to commit anything in this moment, at least. Hey, Eric, looks yes. like you've got, it looks like you have shape files for all the road improvements. Can uh -huh. you put those in place? Uh, we could, we, we just had them as, as GPS or GPX files, so Google Map. I don't know that we have a shape file for them at this point. Okay, you, I'm assuming then that you don't have your new GIS version on yet. No. Okay. So Eric, this is Tyler. I'm assuming that if we don't have funding for the entire thing that you're okay with us funding just a few of these. Absolutely. Uh, again, there's 20 access points. We, we highlighted five many of them need improvements and so if we can get a if we can get all or a portion we'll we'll go to work with that and, and get as much done as we can any way you could break it down so we in in prior prior to us the most you, important one to talk oh prioritize um, yeah <laughs> embarrassing but anyways, that way we know which ones are the most important and how much they'll cost and we'll fund as much as we can or. So we don't have it prioritized at this point, but if you go to the budget uh, under materials and supplies, we've got each of the access points broken down by dollar amount. Uh, yeah, right there, materials and supplies there, bottom line. You were there, yep. And the yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that should work. Yep. Okay. Maybe just go in and put that in the order that you your priorities. Uh, I would be happy to. I'll I'll get in touch with Mark Farmer. Can we if we get that done today? Uh, is that soon enough? Yeah, we won't. Fine. You've got more than just you've got a month or two to do it. Okay, yeah, I'll I'll work with Mark and and figure out which ones are. I'm I, I'm pretty sure that Mill Race is probably the top of the list, but after that, I'm I, I would like their feedback on uh, prioritizing the rest. Thanks, Mark just, and Rob. Yeah. And the outdoor recreation could be another opportunity. I don't know if they're planning on applying for that, but. Eric, have you looked at that outdoor recreation grant on this as well? Uh, not for these in particular, no. We do we do work with them on our marina access points because there's a lot more uh, outdoor recreation element to our marinas as there are kind of more focal points that are developed. Uh, but you're right. I think that they they might bite on on hunter angler access points as well. Do we typically fund uh, access infrastructure with Habitat Council? Yeah. Okay. No, we don't see. Is there more? Is, is there more than hunters and anglers using these access points? I mean, what's the ratio? Uh, that is a great question. I don't know what the actual ratio is, but we definitely have other folks using these access points. We have uh, kite boarders, and we have uh, birders right. in general. So. Utah Lake is our most underutilized fishery in the state, and any access is a, is a plus at Utah Lake. The only thing I'd, I'd like to see is a little bit more participation from the county or any community down there. Uh, there's there's other places that I'm sitting here thinking about the infrastructure money that's available this year. Just wondering if, if those other avenues have been pursued. Uh, and that, that's just a question for you. Yeah, I, I would just mention that uh, on this list, we're, we're, we also have the Utah Lake Shoreline Restoration Project. That's a $508,000 uh, project this year. And we have a ton of, of Utah County participation. And so that's all of the vegetation work that's being done that would complement this project uh, that goes around the entire shoreline of the lake. Uh, it's just the access pieces, you know, public works either they, they've got the bandwidth to run their their trucks and tractors or they don't and this summer they they are overbooked and so we're utilizing them as far as operation of our marsh masters and spray treatments uh just couldn't get them to commit to uh trucker or machine uh operators for the summer 
uh, Danny, do you think maybe this is something that would that would work with our heavy equipment crew? If you're still on. That's a possibility. We're we're pretty booked up, but we could look into it. This might even be a good place to stick them in the winter time. Yeah, that would that would be the best. Right now they're helping on the Delta, which is kind of taking a bunch of time as well. But Delta's asking for even more of their time. Uh, yeah, they, they want us to basically commit our heavy equipment crew to them full time. I'm so used to trying to find work for the heavy equipment crew that it's just a <laughs> reflex for me now. <laughs> right. And we're and we're grateful. <laughs> Well, okay. I, I'll say this. I like it. You'll you'll hear in the next project. Um, the county has been very involved in the the Utah Lake Shoreline mm -hmm. restoration. We've ever brought that here before, but WRI has funded that for probably 12, 13 years, put over a million three or so into that, and that's kind of created the access. If you guys know Utah Lake, 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't a lot of access, and so. Um, I'm definitely supportive of, of what's going on down on the lake, and I think it's time we start helping pay for some access down there. Whether we pay for it all, I think that's something we can discuss at the funding meeting, but um, down in this one. So I'll I'll do a motion to tentatively approve it for funding. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion. One, one thing I would like, and this is just some for Eric and, and maybe Mark Farmer in the central region, is to is, is bring it. A presentation that describes, you know, their their Utah Lake efforts to date, uh, dating back, you know, you said 15 years. This is part of a bigger project, and and Eric kind of mentioned it, uh, just in words, but without actually seeing it, it's hard to get the vision for what's been done and where it's going. And I and I also think that the the grant that Daniel mentioned, uh, which is actually coming to DNR now. Um, I think that's something that we need to explore further in the future as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have a, a motion from Tyler and a second from Drew. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Okay, motion carries. Um, but we'll, depending on in the funding meeting, it could be part or all of it we'll have to wait and see on that so okay last one for us uh i guess eric this is probably you too uh 6050 utah lake shoreline restoration okay uh again this this is the the larger project so this is the entire shoreline of utah lake working on the invasive vegetation removal and and then also proactive uh restoration work so 90 800 acres of or 9,900 acres of shoreline that is now uh, being uh, worked on. Uh, there's a lot of native vegetation coming back in areas where we've seen success. And so uh, we have refined the treatment process to, to allow that native vegetation to, to stay there. Uh, we, can, we can hit the large areas with aerial treatments uh, and then the smaller areas with marsh masters that have uh, sprayless or boomless sprayers on them. And then this year, we're also incorporating uh, drone mapping and drone treatments into the the even smaller areas so that we don't uh, waste time having our marsh masters cruise out to these smaller pockets of Phragmites where they are. Uh, also involved in that is uh, we have a forestry tool uh, that's attached to a skid steer, and that is able to get into these areas that are chock full of uh, tamarisk and Russian olives and get those trimmed down and treated uh, so that we can open up the shoreline again as it has been almost impassable for decades and and this project has really opened it up and, and is allowing uh, folks around the lake to be able to get down to that shoreline again it's it's pretty impressive Do you uh, do you run into any community resistance when you're in, I mean, 10,000 acres is a lot of glyphosate. Um, do you get any community resistance to using glyphosate in those areas? Occasionally. Uh, generally speaking, though, we have 430 parcels that are involved in the treatments and we have uh, signed approvals from 
every one of those parcel owners uh, before we do treatments on, on their portion of the shoreline. So those that are actually involved, generally speaking, unless they graze their own Phragmites down or something like that, or they've taken care of it in some other way, they're giving uh, a letter of approval for us to work on that. I'd also like to add uh, that we've been doing this uh, grazing testing, right, Eric? Oh yeah, so so the we've got a project area. It's it's Powell Slough. We call the larger area Wakara Way, and and it's about a 700 acre portion of the shoreline. We've started a pilot last year that's 50 acres uh, grazing. We enclose the entire thing so that it's not impacting the the lake itself or water and had that grazed down for a season and it looks beautiful. Uh, tons of native vegetation coming back. Uh, we had milkweed uh, and lots of kind of the grasses and, and bulrush coming back in the wetter portions uh, that we didn't even know were there. And so it's, it's pretty cool and we're, we're expanding that throughout that 700 acre area uh, to be a kind of an open space park managed through grazing uh, to take care of the vegetation and, and, and do a, a rest rotation system that, that can benefit the species of wildlife that are use, utilizing that area. So Division of Wildlife will help us and we've got a consultant that's helping develop a grazing plan so that we can graze the different areas to a, a vegetation height that, that is, maximizes habitat value. So another 50,000 from Habitat Council on this one, but you've got uh, watershed. Where's this ranking on? We don't have the rankings yet from Central Region, but traditionally this is usually the first. We're third in Central Region. Yeah, always in the top three or four. Is is this shoreline restoration going to be benefiting uh, like June the June sucker recovery at all, or is this? It does. So one of the biggest problems is that Phragmites grow all the way out into the wetlands really tight. And one of June suckers biggest issues is that they have very little cover along the, well, in Utah Lake. And so the shoreline prior to Phragmites was, was a great rearing habitat uh, that was degraded when Phragmites came in place. And, and one of probably one of the reasons why uh, they were put on the endangered species list. Uh, the more habitat like this, this riparian area uh, that we have more native vegetation where the young fish can kind of have an area of protection from predator uh, issues, uh, the better they they have recruitment. So definitely it has, it has been helpful for the June sucker species. I'm just wondering if part of the uh the financial allocation should be the non-game fish as well as waterfowl and game fish. I just um, copied the last, the other, the previous project. So yeah, I'll make a suggestion and I'll change it. Do you want me to make a suggestion? He's Go probably ahead. the better one. <laughs> You know, I would say uh, put 10% under non-game fish then. As opposed to sport fish? Right, yeah, unless people are fishing for June suckers these days. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. Okay, thoughts on a motion on this one? I moved it through. Okay. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion to approve this project for consideration and a second from Ben. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Motion carries. Okay, that's our last project for today for our second Habitat Council meeting. I uh, appreciate everybody participating and, and being on with this. Um, our next meeting, as a reminder, is 
March 23rd at Farmington Bay, and it'll be our combined uh, Blue Ribbon Habitat Council aquatics or fisheries focused meeting. So um, I need to thank Daniel, uh, Allison, Lisa, Danny Summers for helping us out today, um, and our tech crew uh, for the DNR. And um, that's the last left there. Okay. Yep. And so we'll entertain a motion to adjourn unless anybody has questions. Okay, we have a motion from Jack. Second. A second from Tyler. I'll say aye. 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 I don't think there's any opposed. Okay, we are adjourned until March 23rd. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Nice to meet you, Yeah. Sorry. Farming to